decision on cases from their hearing will be September 15th in the same uh, place. With that, I'm going to turn it over to John Peterson. Okay. Uh a good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and Board, and those watching virtually. Uh, today's hearing will be conducted uh, both in person and virtually. For those participating, uh, participating virtually, uh, you have been signed into a link um, uh, that will allow you to speak if you want to speak. Uh, you know, as far as the virtual participation, uh, if you're opposed to a case, uh, what you do is click in your Q&A box that you're opposed to a certain case. So, for instance, if you're opposed to rezoning case Z13, you would want to type into your Q&A box OPP Z13. If you're, if you're opposed to a case and you also want to speak, you would type in OPP Z13 speak. Uh, conversely, if you're here to support a case, you'd want to punch, uh, uh, punch into the Q&A box that you that, uh Punch in SUPP and then the case number Z13. If you also want to support a case uh, and speak on it, you would punch in SUP Z13 speak. For those that are gonna, gonna speak today, uh, when your case is called, uh, we will, uh, number one, unmute, uh, unmute your computer so you can start speaking. Uh, number two, we would ask that you identify yourself so the board knows who you are and who we're talking to. And third, you just want to affirm that you've been sworn in, so the testimony that you present uh, will be uh, truthfully uh, presented. Um, and today, uh, the hearing will be conducted with the following process and procedure uh, for the in-person people. Uh, each case will be called in numerical order. When each, case, when each case is called, we would ask the applicant please stand and raise their hand to show that they are in attendance. Then we're going to call to see if there's anyone here, anyone here opposed to a case, so they can be counted for the official record. Uh, and we're going to ask they also they also stand and raise their hand if they're here in person. Uh, you know, if they are here opposed virtually, we'll note them uh, in the record that they were here virtually. After recognizing the applicant and any opposition, the applicant and, and any opposition will be asked to come forward and be sworn in uh, for the in-person people so they can uh, present their testimony to the board. The applicant will testify first, and then the opposition, if any, would testify second. It's important to note that each side only gets 10 minutes to state their case of concerns. There's not a rebuttal process, and there's not a process to reserve your time, so please convey all your information to the board within your 10-minute time frame. Additionally, if there's more than one person who wishes to speak on a case, you may want to coordinate with each other about what you're going to talk about, because each side only gets 10 minutes, and you don't want to cover the same information twice. Then after the 10-minute presentation period, the board will start to discuss the matter at hand. From the discussion, they may ask one or more people, uh, either virtually or in person, to come back to the mic for questions or comments. And after that, the board will make a decision to either approve, deny, hold, or continue the case at hand. Uh, there is one uh, case on today's agenda, which has been, been withdrawn without prejudice, will not be heard today. That's reason case Z37 of 2020, Site Centers Corp. This case has been withdrawn without prejudice and will not be heard today. Additionally, there are a number of cases on today's printed agenda, which have been held or continued and will not be heard today. And the cases are as follows. First case is rezoning case Z13 of 2020, Arturo, Arturo Martinez. This case, case has been continued uh, by the staff until the October 6th Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z13 of 2020 will not be heard today. Next case is rezoning case Z39 of 2020, KO Management Incorporated. This case was continued by the staff until the October 6th, 2020 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z39 of 2020 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z44 of 2020, Peach State Salvage Incorporated. This case was continued by the staff until the October 6, 2020 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z44 of 2020 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z45 of 2020, Springhouse Kennesaw. This case has been continued by the staff until the November 3rd, 2020 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z45 of 2020 will not be heard until the November 3rd, 2020 Planning Commission zoning hearing. Rezoning case Z49 of 2020, Sutter Hill Vinings, LP. This case was continued by the staff until the October 6, 2020 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z49 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z51 of 2020, Garner Group. This case was continued by the staff until the October 6, 2020 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z51 of 2020 will not be heard today. And moving into special land use permits that are continued. Uh, SLEP4 of 2020, White Oak Longline Holdings, LLC. 
This case was continued by the staff until the October 6, 2020 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So SLUP 4 of 2020 will not be heard today. And finally, on the printed agenda, ROD 1 of 2020, Atlantic Realty uh, Acquisitions LLC. This case was continued by the staff until the October 6, 2020 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So ROD 1 of 2020 will not be heard today. Mr. Chairman of the Board, there are a number of cases today which have uh, asked for a continuance after our deadline last week. So I'm going to go through these one, one by one, and we would need the Planning Commission to vote on these cases to continue to your next hearing date. Okay. Uh, first case I have is rezone case Z52, Carl Edward Dills. The applicant is asking this case be continued, Mr. Chairman of the Board. Okay. And I know he's present because I talked to him about it, so I'll make a motion that we continue Z52 till our October hearing. Second. Okay. We have a second from Alice, so all in favor? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody that's a five to zero in favor. Okay, and that is continued to your October 6, 2020 Planning Commission zoning year. Yes. Next case I have is rezoning case Z53, the Revive Land Group LLC. The applicant is asking this case be continued until your October 6th Planning Commission zoning hearing date, Mr. Chairman of the Board. Okay, and I also talked to the uh, representative for that case, and they do want it continued, so I will uh, make a motion that we continue Z53 to our October hearing. Second. Second. Okay, I just Alice beat you to it, so. Uh, and then we'll all in favor raise your hand okay that's a five to zero vote Are you in favor okay uh next case i have that's asking for continuance is lup 17 of 2020 uh evangelos uh m the mr house and joyce b the mr house they are asking for a continuous mr chairman board so they can work with the community a little bit more okay and that's judy's case Oh, you're muted, Judy. You're still muted. Judy? I make, I make a motion that, I make a motion that we um, continue continue this until the October meeting. Okay, I'll second that. And all in favor? Raise your hands. So that's a five to zero. Okay, next case I have is uh, SLUP 9, Christian Crawford. This case does need to be continued, Mr. Chairman of Board, because uh, I need to work on some mailings. So the staff would ask you to continue this case until your October 6th hearing date. And that one's Judy's as well. Is that, is that, is that slip 8 you're talking about or slip 9? Uh, we're doing slip 9 right now. Oh, okay. Hey, Jim, how did you say we needed to hold that case? Oh, here it is. They have not submitted their proof of mailing yet, so we're waiting on that to be done correctly. Oh, okay. Make a motion that we can continue it to the October meeting. Second. Okay, second by Alice. All in favor? And uh, it's a five to zero vote in favor. Okay. And then the last case I have is SLUP 8 of 2020. 1420 Lockhart Holdings LLC. It's my understanding the applicant would like to meet with the uh, with some representatives about their case. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Donald have talked to him, and uh, I'll make a motion we continue this into the October meeting. Second. Okay, second from Alice. All in favor? There's, okay, Tony, all five zero in favor. Okay. And that's all the cases I have that need to be continued that weren't on the agenda already, Mr. Chairman of the Board. Thank you, John. Uh, okay, I got a couple more announcements here that we can get to going on the consent agenda. Uh, I would like to ask the people in today's audience, and when you're talking virtually, to please turn your cell phone off. The ringing of the cell phone does interfere with the broadcast and presentation. And any person wishing to speak before the Board of Commissioners must file a campaign contribution disclosure statement. If within two years immediately preceding the filing of a rezoning application, a campaign contribution totaling two hundred fifty dollars more was made to a current member of the Board of Commissioners, additional information about this requirement is located in the hearing room uh, on the back table. And I want to remind applicants, opposition, or any interested party that information is due to this board the Wednesday prior to this hearing. Any information submitted after the Wednesday due date 
may or may not be, uh, be considered by the board at their discretion. And with that, Mr. Chairman of the Board, I'm ready to start the consent agenda. Okay, go ahead, John. Cobb County Planning Commission zoning hearing consent agenda for September 1st, 2020. Uh, rezoning case Z47, Alan P. and Christine A. Strong. Request rezoning from RA5 to R20 for a single family home in landlot 696 of the 17th district. The property is located on the south side of Lee Road, west of Atlanta Road. Staff recommends approval subject to uh, the following conditions. Number one, site plan review comments and recommendations. Number two, water and sewer comments and recommendations. And number three, Department of Transportation comments and recommendations. Uh, with the deletion of recommendation number one, uh, the applicant is here, Mr. Chairman of the Board, and there was no one here opposed. Um, we took roll here shortly before 9 o'clock, so that one should be okay to go. Uh, so, okay. Next case is a moving in the land use permits, uh, LUP 15. Christine Myers requests a temporary land use permit uh, for a home hair salon in Landlot 547 of the 16th District. The property is located on the north side of Trith Springs Way, west of Trith Springs Drive. Staff recommends approval for 24 months, subject to the following conditions. Number one, no more than five customers per day. Number two, no signs. Number three, no parking in the right-of-way. And number four, all customers by appointment only. The applicant is here, Mr. Chairman Board, and there was no one here opposed when we took roll before nine o'clock. And last thing on the consent agenda is LEP 16. Devereaux Advanced Behavioral Health, Georgia, request a tempor temporary land use permit uh, for the purpose of a foster care administrative office in the Landlot 621 of the 19th District. The property is located on the southeast side of Powder Springs Road, southwest of Tiffany, excuse me, southwest of Tiffany Drive. Staff recommends approval for 12 months, subject to the following conditions. Number one, maximum sign size be two feet by four feet to be attached to the building. Number two, maximum of six vehicles to be parked uh, on the property at any given time. Number three, at, at no time shall there be any parking in the right of way. Number four, staff comments and recommendations. Number five, Department of Transportation comments and recommendations, not otherwise in conflict. And number six, site plan uh, contained in the zoning analysis. The applicant is here, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Chairman Board, and there was no one here opposed on which we're all at nine o'clock. And now we conclude the consent agenda, Mr. Chairman of Board. Okay, and we wanted to add on Z48 to consent. Okay, let me go ahead and read that one in real quick. Okay. Okay. Rezoning case Z48, Bennett Real Estate Holdings LLC, request a rezoning from R20 and NRC to NRC for a child daycare center. And then lot 44, the 18th district. The property is located on the south side of Veterans Memorial Highway, east of Kitchens Road, and on the north side of Wallace Road. Uh, sure. I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. And I recommend uh, that we recommend approval of that subject to all staff comments and recommendations not otherwise in conflict. Uh, the site plan received August 31st, 2020. Uh, all fencing within 100 feet of Veterans Memorial Highway right away to meet design guidelines. Uh, fences further than 100 feet may be black vinyl coated chain link or, or meet design guidelines. All fencing to have landscaping between the fence and the right of way. Uh, the landscape buffer to be approved by the county arborist buffer to be installed by November 1st, 2020. The parking lot to be completed within 180 days of Board of Commissioners final zoning decision. No access to Lawless Road. And the district commissioner may approve minor modifications except those that increase the overall building square footage, cause a reduction in the size of the approved buffer change an access location to a different roadway, change that is in conflict with an express stipulation or condition of zoning, or requires a variance or violates cop county ordinance. That would be that case, and that's our last one on consent, so we would 
Need a motion for the consent agenda? Mr. Chairman? Oh, yes, sir. Um, item to correct on Z47, it was supposed to be uh, the DOT comments and recommendations that were deleted number three not number one because we were trying to uh we were trying to avoid the donation of right away that was not comparable with the other lots on that street okay i'm flipping to it real quick so that's the DOT comment <laughs> In the, in the DOT comments, it's uh, their recommendation number one that they wanted to plead regarding the donation of right away. Okay, so you're just referencing that 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 portion of DOT. Got it. That's right. Okay. Okay. But fine, then. So I guess we're good there. Uh, okay, then we need a motion. Make, uh, make a motion. We approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second from Tony. All in favor, raise your hand. That's a five to zero for approval. Okay, what's next, John? Okay, so the consent agenda is already approved, right? Correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, moving in to the agenda. I guess we're gonna we're gonna move to Z forty right now. Let me read this into the record. <clears throat> Rezoning case Z40 of 2020, Brooks Chadwick Capital LLC, request rezoning from R20 and R30 to R15 for a single family residential subdivision. Land lots 183, 184, 185, 248, and 249 of the 16th district. The property is located on the east and west sides of Wesley Chapel Road, south of Sandy Plains Road, and on the southern terminus of uh, Foxwood Court and the eastern terminus of Hanover Court. Mr. Chair and Board, the applicant is present. Uh, there are currently seven people here in person opposed to the case. There are 10 people here virtually opposed to the case with one person uh, who would like to speak uh, in support. At this time, I would ask everyone here in person to come forward to be sworn in, and I'll turn this over to the applicant to start their presentation. Okay. Okay. John, you just before you sit. Go ahead, Kevin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Planning Commissioners. I'm Kevin Moore here uh, on behalf of the applicant Brooks Chadwick Capital in this application for rezoning uh, a property uh, that is uh, comprised of 49.2 acres uh, located on Wesley Chapel Road. Uh, the tracks, uh, the track or property uh, is actually divided by Wesley Chapel Road and uh, it lies on the both east and west portions of Wesley Chapel Road. The property is currently zoned R30 and R20. Uh, in this 49 acres, we are seeking rezoning uh, to the R15 category uh, for a residential subdivision, uh, just as all the other subdivisions have uh, been rezoned and developed uh, to the R15 category along Wesley Chapel Road. And what you're seeing in front of you, it's that overall zoning map. You see Wesley Chapel Road running down the middle, kind of winding its way there. Uh, you see our property, uh, proposed property there in the middle uh, that's zoned R30 as well as R20. Uh, if you look toward the right hand side of the road, the right hand side of your screen, uh, you'll see that uh, the right hand track, those zoned R30, uh, is surrounded completely by uh, other subdivisions that are zoned R15 and that were rezoned to R15 and developed according to the R15 categories. On the left hand side uh, of Wesley Chapel, our property is actually zoned R30 and a portion of it. Uh, to the left is also zoned R20. Uh, you'll see that it also has R15 uh, subdivision uh, that is uh, on its southern side, uh, the below side, zoned R15. Uh, then you have an older subdivision 
Uh, that is R20 uh, that comes off of Sandy Plains. Uh, you'll also note how uh, that R20 subdivision has dead end streets into this property, uh, which is how it used to be done. Sometimes they would dead end the streets into property thinking uh, that one day uh, that property would be added to it. Uh, we're not doing that with our proposal and we think that's extremely important. Uh, otherwise, without rezoning, uh, those roads would be utilized uh, to develop uh, this property uh, as well. Uh, going to the next uh, slide, a little bit about continuing about this surrounding area and R15 subdivisions. And what we've done is just simply highlight for your consideration uh, the densities of the surrounding subdivisions that have been zoned R15 and developed as R15. Uh, those subdivisions include the Highlands at Wesley Chapel, both the east and west sides. Highlands at Wesley Chapel uh, uh, subdivision was zoned and developed much like what we are prop proposing here today, uh, a tract on the east side and on the west side. And you'll see that the densities uh, of those respective uh, Highlands at Wesley Chapel are 1.64 units per acre and over two units per acre. Also subdivisions off of uh, and in the surrounding area, Mabry Grove, Spring Mill, Beacon Hill, Village of North Highlands, Creekside Bluffs, as well as Lock Highland, including the sections that are adjacent to us, Unit 3, Sections 3, 4, and 5. What you see from this chart is that those densities range from 1.605 units per acre to 2.16 units per acre. So the average density of the surrounding R15 developments along this area is 1.84 units per acre. Uh, to this next slide, uh, what we're proposing and what Brooks Chadwick Capital is proposing is a total of 81 homes uh, with a density of 1.65 units per acre. And it's identified by your professional staff. This is on the very low end of the densities of the surrounding R15 subdivisions. Also, it's on the very low end of what uh, densities typically provide for R15. As you are aware, and some others may not be, R15 on average yields 2.1 units per acre. So that you can see here uh, that what Brooks Chadwick Capital is doing uh, is providing for a rezoning and a future subdivision that is entirely consistent with the surrounding area and entirely consistent with the surrounding area's uh, densities of their subdivisions, in fact, on the very low end. Uh, turning now to uh, the site plan itself, again, you can see that our proposal uh, is on either side of Wesley Chapel Road, uh, both the right hand and left hand as you're looking at this screen. Uh, we are providing uh, for a full amenity uh, for this 81 uh, home subdivision uh, on the right hand side and you can see where we identified where that amenity would be located. Also, uh, because of how these tracks are aligned along Wesley Chapel, uh, we have aligned the entrances uh, to, uh, to these uh, proposed subdivision. Uh, across Wesley Chapel. Uh, that is done for obvious safety and uh, public safety and traffic standpoint to align those two entrances at that location. Uh, that also has been determined and verified to have appropriate site distance to meet uh, Cobb County DOT uh, standards. Also, what we have done, and it's included in our stipulation letter, is uh, because we do have adjoining subdivisions, uh, the uh, required rear setback for R15 is 30 feet. Uh, what we have done and agreed to is to increase that rear setback and thereby increase the distance uh, from the rear to 40 feet. Uh, so we have uh, requested and uh, committed to a rear setback uh, of a minimum of 40 feet as opposed to 30 feet, thereby furthermore pulling these homes in and away from their adjoining R15 and R20 neighbors. And doing so, we have also uh, decreased the front setback to 25 feet uh, so as to not expand the house box, so to speak, but to simply move that box forward uh, in order to provide for additional room to the rear. In addition, what you'll find on this uh, site plan uh, is that we are providing for full protection of the streams that cross through this property, uh, noting the pro appropriate stream buffers and stream protection uh, that we have included as part of our plans. Uh, in addition, we have gone a couple of steps further identifying and working with Cobb County Stormwater Management Division to identify specific uh, comments that they have that that division has made as well as included in our stipulation letter, uh, recognizing and acknowledging the sensitivity of stormwater issues in this area, specifically uh, with the lake at Lock Highland. Uh, and we have acknowledged that and understand that completely. In addition, uh, we have uh, 
in our discussions with the Lock Highland Homeowners Association, as well as the Homeowners Association for Highlands of Wesley Chapel, included specific stipulations so that they can be part of our planning and permitting process and they can have an opportunity uh, to engage in that process with their engineers and ensure that our stormwater management controls and best management practices will protect the downstream streams and lakes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have also provided uh, for uh, buffer stipulations above and beyond uh, the fact that R15 against R15 does not require buffers. Uh, what we're demonstrating here uh, is that we have provided for a minimum, that is a minimum 15 foot undisturbed buffer during construction and development for the entire perimeter, except for one portion uh, where we've actually increased that requirement. Uh, and we've highlighted uh, just the uh, seven instances in small locations where we would have to uh, go into that 15 feet uh, to account for some topography. Uh, and we've identified those locations and, and have agreed and committed to replanting those areas with significant plantings uh, wherever uh, we are uh, disturbing. In addition, along the left-hand side, uh, it, as you're looking at your screen, uh, there's a street adjacent to this property called Sweat Creek Run. Uh, that's a single loaded street at that location through our lots number one through 11 along that lower left hand side. Uh, we have specific stipulations dealing with the buffer along that uh, stretch. Uh, this unique situation with homes on the other side of the street that face uh, the rear, uh, so to speak, of our subdivision in that one location. We've worked very, very diligently with those homeowners have enjoyed that. I've uh, been able to really discuss and meet with them on site and work through specific sti stipulations that call for uh, increased buffers, increased berming and planting along that stretch uh, due to the unique circumstances there. Uh, and we were able to come to a good agreement with them as it relates to uh, those aspects of our proposed development. Uh, next slide. We also wanted to provide uh, some examples and representative examples of the types of homes that would be built uh, in this subdivision. Uh, we are proposing a subdivision that will be consistent and greater than the quality uh, and price ranges of homes along Wesley Chapel. Uh, we anticipate price ranges in the 800s to over a million. Uh, we want to provide representative examples of the types of homes uh, so that those folks that can see and understand that, yes, this will be an extremely nice subdivision, of high quality. Uh, again, you have uh, Brooks Chadwick Capital, which is one of the premier uh, not best uh, developers in Cobb County uh, with a long track record and it's a well-earned reputation for quality. Uh, and as we flip through these uh, uh, home visuals, you can see the variety of homes uh, which uh, would be uh, built and are projected and representative of what would be built in our proposed new subdivision. And this property uh, has been owned for generations uh, by uh, the Willis family. Uh, this property is 49 acres. Uh, the surrounding area has been fully developed around this property. Uh, it's been fully rezoned from R30 and R20 and other areas uh, adjacent to this property and in and along Wesley Chapel to R15. R15 is the established zoning category and development style for Wesley Chapel Road. It's why we came in for R15 rezoning. It's why Brooks Chadwick in reviewing uh, this uh, area and this property believed and strongly believed that R15 was entirely appropriate to be consistent, so to be compatible, to come in very much on the very low end of the density scale compared to the surrounding subdivisions and build uh, a quality subdivision that will be consistent with and continue to enhance uh, the residential neighborhood and community in and among Wesley Chapel Road. Uh, I'm here and I can answer any questions that you may have. Uh, we do respectfully request your recommendation of approval uh, please note that we have a, a stipulation letter dated August 26 that was submitted uh, with uh, all of these stipulations uh, that I've referenced and more. In addition, we submitted yesterday a stipulation letter dated August 31, which is a supplemental letter, which included additional agreements that we had made with our adjacent neighbors. Uh, and we would ask that you include both of those letters uh, in your consideration. And if ultimately a recommendation for approval, also include those letters. Again, we note uh, that your professional staff has recommended approval and likewise your land use plan uh, also uh, would uh, evaluate this and say it's also within the land use plan confines as well with that uh, we respectfully request your recommendation of approval thank you thank you kevin uh, now we'll hear from the opposition Good 
morning, planning commissioners. Thank you for having us today. It's an honor to be able to present our thoughts on application number Z40. My name is Josh Garber, and I'm the president of the Highlands of Wesley Chapel HOA. Since July, we have been working diligently to communicate our neighborhood concerns to the, to the developer and work out an amicable resolution that we believe fairly addresses our primary concerns. These concerns are outlined in our impact statement that was filed with the county on July 29th and the various emails sent by the residents. We therefore appreciate the additional time and opportunity the Planning Commission gave us over the last month to help resolve these concerns with the developer. In the stipulation letters submitted by Kevin Moore on August 26th and August 31st, we are asking be made a part of zoning conditions. The developers provided the following concessions. Stipulations 1, 2, 3, in letter dated August 31st, and stipulations 16, 17, 18, and 19, in the letter dated August 26th. These stipulations are being provided to address the buffer concerns raised by our neighborhood. Without these stipulations, our neighborhood home values will be negatively impacted as much as 15%. Stipulation 20, in the letter dated August 26th, this stipulation helps to address the traffic and safety concerns that impact our neighborhood. And finally, stipulations 10, 11, and 22 in a letter dated August 26th. These stipulations help to address the watershed and runoff concerns that may impact properties along Sweat Creek Run. We believe that these stipulations fairly address the primary concerns raised by our neighborhood based on the proposed rezoning request. We therefore ask that the Planning Commissioners approve these stipulations as written and agreed upon by the developer and the Wesleyans and the Highlands of Wesley Chapel HOA and make them part of the final zoning conditions. With these stipulations being made part of the zoning approval conditions, we will withdraw our opposition. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. My name is Ben Lowers from the Springville subdivision to the southeast of the tract property. I stand with hundreds of homeowners in those six adjacent neighborhoods uh, nearby in opposition. Speaking today or standing with me are members of the boards from Rangery Forest, the Highlands, Lock Highlands, Westchester, and Woodbine Station. I have delivered to you and the county commissioners the names and other details of more than 975 signatories in the opposition petition to this rezoning. A sizable opposition. There are approximately 52 homes presently adjacent to this tract of land, yet we received more than 975 adults who expressed their opposition, not just verbally, not with a head nod, not with an uh-huh, but with their signature. Please do not dismiss this documented widespread opposition to this rezoning. One specific point for me is I live on the creek, a major, uh, a major creek that is a minor waterway in the scheme of things that uh, is part of my property. I, every time I touch that piece of land, I have to think twice about the impact that I'm going to have when I go and adjust anything on that property. Sometimes I have to contact the stormwater, stormwater department, but the reality is this site plan shows where more than five homes have significant portions of their land that is encroaching in the 25, 50, 75 foot impervious and no disturbed buffers. This is not acceptable. Would you like to have the downspot of the corner of your house and the the shrubs and the mulch be actually in that boundary to restrict your activities? Would you like to have a third of your front yard be within the 50 foot no disturb? Would, wait, would you have a lawn or never, never lawn? It's, it's not doable with 80, 81 homes. Uh, please consider if you may, that this uh, proposed, this requested rezoning is widely opposed. And we would ask that you would consider that in your recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I'm Shankar Mahadevan from Lock Highland Subdivision. Dear members of the Planning Commission, Lock Highland residents are concerned with the rezoning proposal. The concerns stem from the impact to the increased percentage of impervious surface, traffic in the vicinity, and the lake in the subdivision. COP continues to allow clear cutting of forested property and increased percentage of impervious surfaces. There should be a reduced amount of allowable overall impervious surface, particularly a lower percentage on the property bordering Perth Trace property. There needs to be a tree preservation plan to reduce the amount of increased volume and velocity of the runoff due to no tree canopy and increased impervious surface. We ask to be presented with the hydrology report to the homeowners prior to the 
Board of Commission zoning meeting. Lock Island residents are seriously concerned with the silt that will be added into the lakes in this subdivision. The developer should pay for a study to be conducted by Lock Island or optionally the developer and Lock Island enter into a memorandum of understanding that set that spells out the silt studies before and after including remediation if increase is noted. A traffic study needs to be conducted to improve the driving conditions on Wesley Chapel Road. Again, the impact to the lakes at Lock Island are a major concern to the residents. Lock Island has spent approximately 1.5 million in the past 10 years on dredging our lakes with an ever increasing frequency requirement to dredge. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you speaker. And Mr. Chair, before we move on to the next in-person speaker, there are some folks here who are virtually here to speak. So how does the board want to handle that? Because there's about half the time left right now. Okay, why don't we rotate back and forth between in-person and, and that. So let's do a virtual next. Okay. And if needed, we'll extend the time a little bit. Okay, thank you. We're going, we're going, we're going. Peter, you should be able to speak now. Great. Here on the line. I think we. Are you calling any particular virtual opposition or just anyone? Uh, probably if you're unmuted, you can go ahead and talk. Yeah. So can you hear me? Okay. This is David Fortenberry. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you all. Thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I am a resident at 4279 Wesley Chapel Road, currently an R30 designation. So uh inconsistent with uh, what mr moore has shared not everyone is in r15 uh, i too am concerned i i i'm concerned about the traffic for sure indeed wesley chapel is known as a major cut through between sandy plains and shallowford road bearing heavy traffic day and night i think with the addition of 81 homes at r15 it would seem conservative to have at minimum 100 or 160 additional cars traveling on the road uh, people walk, children cross those roads every single day. And I think that leads me to, I think, a couple of my major concerns. Uh, these homes would be aligned to the elementary school district at Harrison Mill, which, of course, is located adjacent to this proposed new community. Uh, adding buses and more cars makes traveling Wesley Chapel even more problematic. Uh, but I think there's even still a bigger issue that would be impacted if C40 is approved. Um, you could expect, on average, uh, you know, 75 to maybe 90 additional elementary school children attending Garrison Mill. And according to the Cobb County Enrollment Projection Study from May 2019, Garrison Mill is already at a 99.5% capacity with a conservative 75 additional elementary enrollees. Garrison Mill would reach 112% capacity and will well exceed the current student-teacher ratio of 15 to 1. Uh, these are all county reported data. Um, uh, I do believe that uh, that would be certainly problematic uh, from a school uh, perspective given an increase in housing density and more families uh, being a part of this neighborhood. Um, also, uh, on an unrelated note, but a separate issue is the proposed development is part of a known flood zone. Um, I, I guess the question is, are there any data or assessments that can predict the flooding and downstream impact on so many new homes in the area? And so I defer to uh, my neighbors from Lock Island on that same point of concern about uh, what this would do to some of the, uh, the the runoff. So what I would ask, just based on this and some open questions that still need to be answered, 
Um, I respectfully ask that the commission deny the applicant's request to rezone the track of 49 acres uh, to R15. Uh, at minimum, uh, I would ask the county to order an impact assessment on traffic, an impact assessment on the school system, county services, the flood assessment, and any ecosystem disruption study before rendering any final recommendation for the Board of Commissioners. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. We ready? We're ready, Andy. <laughs> Andy Smith. I'm here representing, volunteering to represent Lock Highland Subdivision and on behalf of all the downstream neighbors. Uh, Chairman Porter and commissioners, thank you for this opportunity to address you on this KC40. The applicant in this case is asking for rezoning to the R15 category of a property that's currently approximately three quarters R30 and the remaining portion zoned R20. Their request increases the maximum allowable number of units from 58, according to staff, to the 81 requested. If the Planning Commission recommends approval of this rezoning, I ask that no variances to the R15 minimum lot size, minimum setbacks, or maximum impervious surface be allowed. It's important to remember that these values are minimums. The topography and other site restrictions often require that these minimums are exceeded, possibly significantly so to achieve a well-planned community. The more difficult the site, the less dense the development. This is for the good of the proposed community and the surrounding neighborhood, and it's how it should be. I further request that you not allow averaging of the maximum impervious area, each lot individually, not to exceed 35%, or buffer averaging of the required 50-foot undisturbed stream buffer, except as needed to compensate for the buffer lost due to required stream crossings. These are tools used in planning a community to maximize density and are not consistent with the best practices to control stormwater runoff, protect the streams and downstream neighbors. I also ask that penetrations of the 50 foot disturbed, undisturbed stream buffer not be allowed except at the planned permanent stream crossings. Over the past 10 years, Lock Highland neighborhood has spent over one and a half million dollars dredging silt from the lake deposited by upstream development and homeowner improvements. The developer absolutely should, and I hope will be held accountable for all silt from this project traveling downstream during the site development and home construction. Unfortunately, homeowners often make changes to their property after the contractors have left and monitoring of the siltation has ended. These changes range from the innocent clearing of a backyard and unwittingly removing a required buffer to the overt routing of runoff directly to a stream without the opportunity to, for absorption and everything in between. The stream buffer is required to protect the stream and the downstream neighbors. For this reason, I request that the applicant not be allowed to include any of the required 50 foot undisturbed stream buffer in the platted lots. This will provide additional protection from the land disturbance and construction activity and prevent homeowners making improvements to their properties from violating the 50 foot buffer. This together with the already required inclusion of language in the recorded deeds regarding the 75 foot impervious buffer will make this community better and reduce the potential down damage downstream. It's time we stop asking the downstream neighbors to pay for the excesses of development upstream. Thank you for your consideration of these requests. Thank you, Andy. Next virtual speaker, I guess. Mr. Chairman. Yes. This is Brian Johnson, County Attorney's Office. Uh, the applicants moved for just under 12 minutes. We are about at that point for the opposition. So we would be at the discretion of this commission to grant extra time. Okay. And how many, do, you, do we know how many more we have who want to speak? We have one virtual speaker. One virtual speaker. How many want to speak here person? Want to speak? Yeah. Great. You're okay with that information. Yeah. Okay. So it looks, Mr. Chairman, it looks like we have one virtual speaker, one in-person speaker. Uh, applicant can have some extra time since the uh, position is going over. If the if the commission agrees to that. Okay. What what I'll do is 
We'll hear those two speakers, but ask them to remain brief in their comments. So, not to interrupt you, Mr. Chairman, it turns out we also have one virtual speaker in support of this application. So, okay, so we'll, we'll let that one in support talk. <laughs> talk to them, so. Okay. Just, just ask the people who are going to speak to not try not to repeat what others have said. Just give us anything new and be brief because we've gone over in time. Charles Sprayberry. Good morning. This is Charles Sprayberry with the Cobb County School District. I'd like to thank Chairman Porter and the commissioners for the time this morning uh, to discuss uh, some rezoning issues here. Uh, first, I'd like to ask, with the commission meeting, with the board of commissioners meeting on the 15th, I cannot make that meeting. Can my comments today be read in at that meeting? I'll defer to staff to answer that. Hey, Charles, this is this John Peterson's zoning. Just email those to me and I'll email them to the board commission. All right, I will do that. Thank you. Uh, approval of this petition will cause concern for CCS to be as it will impact the enrollment of students already at schools over capacity, such as Garrison Mill, which this will make them over capacity by 40 students. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Charles. And next speaker. Good morning. Thank you for your time. I just would like to say very, very briefly, no one has brought this up. Can you give us your name before you do that? Oh, I'm very sorry. Catherine Comer, Rain Tree Forest. I just wanted to bring up that there are incredibly large established trees on that property. Attorney Moore did mention that the other neighborhoods are similar. But one thing that he failed to mention, and he told me this before, he said, I live in a subdivision. I have no right to say anything. When my subdivision was built, it left a lot of the established trees. I think right now we're all wearing masks. No one can deny the importance of air quality and the impact that trees have on that as massive filters. The last property that he represented that's very close to there, they said they were going to place trees again, and they didn't. They took them down. They never replace them. I just wish there were some way to preserve some of those established trees. I get that it's important for people to have a place to live. It brings in tax money to the county, but I just wish we could leave some of the established trees in the process. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think that I believe that completes the opposition. Is that correct? Correct, sir. Okay. Then how much time can we go over versus? <laughs> The applicant's time. The opposition went to about 14 minutes, so there should be two extra minutes for uh, support of the applicant. Okay, let's hear from that virtual speaker that's in support. Peter, thank you. My speaker's been, I don't have a video feed. I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak here today, and I'll be very brief. I'm a 28 year resident of the Beacon Hill subdivision and our concerns are really twofold. One is we would very much like to have considered sidewalk end to end on Wesley Chapel from Shaliford all the way to Sandy Plains because as everyone else has discussed here today, the additional traffic, the additional foot traffic and there's a, a real large amount or significant amount of foot traffic parking at Garrison Mill work walking to the new Maybury Park. So that would be one thing that we would very strongly hope that could happen when this subdivision is built. Secondarily, it, someone mentioned it earlier about the amount of traffic, including the semis. I'd very much like the DOT to put signs, no trucks over 40,000 pounds on the, the Wesley Chapel run. And with that, I will yield back my time and say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Well, thank you. And does that leave a little bit of time for Kevin? Yes, about one minute. 
Okay. Kevin like to speak? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I can uh, briefly, briefly make some additional remarks. Um, just wanted to point out that in our stipulation letter, uh, we have provided for and included Lock Highland subdivision as well as Highlands of Wesley Chapel to be part of our uh, permitting and engineering process where we will be providing them plans ahead of time and performing uh, both pre and post development studies of the lake in Lock Highland just as requested. Um, also, uh, to speak to our proposal. Uh, our proposal does not include a single variance for uh, the R15 standards. In fact, it increases those standards by increasing the rear setback uh, uh, to provide for additional room along the perimeter. Uh, we are not seeking uh, variances from the R15 category standards. In fact, we're going above and beyond. Uh, as opposed to every single other R15 subdivision downstream from us, including Lock Highland, which includes uh, the stream buffers within their lots, uh, our proposal actually takes those stream buffers and puts them in open space to be protected by the uh, future homeowners association as opposed to being included uh, within individual lots. There are a couple of lots where we are, have asked for buffer averaging, but that also likewise correspondingly increases uh, the amount of area that we're setting aside in protected open space as opposed to what every other subdivision has done and that is include those stream buffers within their lots. We are not proposing to do that whatsoever. With that, uh, again, uh, we respectfully request your recommendation for approval. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And this is being handled by both uh, Judy and Tony, so I'll let you pick who wants to go first. I th this is Judy. Um, I think Tony, Tony and I have been working on this case together. And I believe I'm going to start off the comments on it, and then Tony's going to finish up. Uh, uh, and I guess before you go, I should say we're now closing the public portion of the hearing. Oh, okay. But I forgot to do that. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. So the property is a unique piece of property. It's the first time I've ever worked on a piece of property that had the, uh, it's a split district. Uh, it represents District 2 and it represents District 3. I don't know who's making all that noise with that paper, but I think you're nothing. <laughs> Not us. I, I know it's not y'all too. Somebody downstairs, somebody's rattling paper and I can't hear. Um, the, the property is unique in that it is on both sides of the road. It was zoned um, to the R15 classification. And it was done back in, let's see, um, 2007, it looks like. The uh, Collins at uh, Wesley Chapel was zoned uh, for 24 acres for 49 lots at a density of 2.02. I'm giving these two because these are right adjacent to it. The um, Highlands at Wesley Chapel in 2006 it was 27 acres with 45 lots at a density of 1.64. So the density of this project is the lowest density that we've seen with R15. R15, Lock Highlands is R15. Um, so just a brief history. At the time of the zoning, Ms. Willis owned the track of land that now everybody sees as what they thought was their buffer, but in reality it was her land. She opposed the zoning of the Highlands at Wesley Chapel. She opposed it. She took her land. They zoned it anyway. They took she took her land and she put it in a conservation easement. So for all these years the people in the Highlands at Wesley Chapel have been enjoying what they thought was their buffer. Reality it is someone else's buffer. Um, she's at a time in her life so the attorney has told us that where she wants to um, take care of her estates and I don't blame her. We all, the older I get, the more I think I've got to settle everything. So um, that's the purpose of us being here. We've gotten a lot of emails from people in the surrounding subdivisions um, making comments. Some of the concerns that we had if we discussed it has been about the, um, the stormwater, some about the traffic on Wesley Chapel. Wesley Chapel uh, is a winding two-lane road. It always has been a winding two-lane road. 
people still bought their houses on that wind and two lane road and will continue to buy houses on that wind and two lane road. It's not going to be widened. There's no money to widen it. So we're not going to be looking at widening, widening the road. The other concern has been the school. Tony has, uh, I'm going to let Tony read a little statement about the schools because he has it that he had sent out this little statement. Tony, do you have that about the school situation? Yes, I do. Let me see here. Got a lot of notes here. So one of the things we looked at on the school, um, in addition to the uh, to the projections for five and 10 year enrollments, uh, we looked specifically even down to the grade level. And we were able to look at the October 2019 uh, enrollments and see that, for instance, the kindergarten, first and second grade were at running right about 100 students per grade level. And that the third, fourth and fifth grade were running closer to 100 to 125 students per grade level. So we've looked at that and, and feel that the projections for a decrease are, are solid. We know that the, um, that the demographer that was engaged to do the studies, looks at building permits and looks at buildable land and, and all the data that they have available. So we feel comfortable that those projections uh, include uh, situations like this where the neighborhood is being developed. And we also know that the county has a $70 million portion of their SPLOST fund for unallocated classrooms. So in the event that a school does exceed capacity uh, beyond what, what, is, what is, it's capable of handling, then, uh, then the county does have funds for uh, for additions where needed uh, as like a contingency. Thank you, Tony. So, as I said, Tony and I have worked very closely together on this. We've met with the attorney. The first thing when we met with attorney um, Kevin Moore was that going into uh, the Highlands at Wesley Chapel. It's a beautiful subdivision. It, it's absolutely the homes are beautiful. Everything about it. And the first thing you notice is. With the development, it didn't matter where it was developed, R30 or it was developed R20, whatever it was developed, they were going to see the back of the homes. So our first priority was to try to figure out how we could protect the backs of their, them, keep them from looking in the backs of uh, adjacent property. Um, so we worked on that. We presented the um, step to um, Kevin about where they wouldn't do a no grading. Uh, we addressed the um, concerns that we had about at the time about the stormwater and the watershed problem that we might have. And we also uh, worked with DOT about the entrances. There's a strip of land, as we all know, that goes down into Wesley, the Highlands at Wesley Chapel. It's a 10 foot strip. Uh, so you can't have access onto their street anyway with that 10 foot in there. So. At this time, I want to call up very briefly just to talk about Dave Braden. Are you doing it or is uh, Carl doing it? I don't. The stormwater. Should be Carl. I think Carl did the comments, Judy. Okay. So I won't. You on, Carl? So, yeah. Carl, just briefly talk, just very briefly about um, the position that we're going to be on in the watershed on the uh, site plan. And do we have a plan in place to control the water? I think that was one of the concerns of Mr. Smith um, about them suffering downstream. So could you tell us briefly how we would control that? I know about the first flush and stuff, but would you explain really briefly about how we will control the water runoff during the plan review process? Yes, during the plan review process, they would um, uh, provide the, the hydrology studies and also We've got the pre and post sediment studies um, for the Lock Island Lakes and um, uh, the, the detention water quality ponds are outside those streams and we'll control the uh, impervious uh, runoff. Okay. Uh, Carl, did you see any lots that might have to come out of this? Any reduction in lots because of the problems of the, um, where the detention is going to be. Did you see any lots that might have to come out? There might be a few on the Eastern side, mm -hmm. um, just a minor changing, but I think, um, Kevin had mentioned maybe, uh, uh, buffer averaging to keep those lots in, in there just a little bit, but, uh, um, very, very few lots. Okay. 
especially on the western side, uh, they've pulled those lots out of the stream buffer. All right, good. We had asked them to do that, and we wanted to make sure that that had occurred. Um, thank you, Carl. Mm -hmm. The uh, next person is, I'm not sure who's handling DOT. I can't see. Amy, are you doing it? or is Who's doing DOT? Do we have a DOT? Yes, Amy. D yes, Amy. DOT, I'm here. Amy, would you briefly discuss the, what we've talked about, the traffic on Wesley Chapel and the alignment of the street? As far as the driveways for this development? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> we have a Cobb County development standards, and in those standards, it says that, that roadways slash driveways should either line up or be offset 150 feet. Given the small frontages that these these lots have on um, Wesley Chapel Road, then it would not be able to achieve that 150 foot offset. I don't believe so. Um, we recommended that they line them up. Okay, and they would have to prove that to you with a track before they could get any permits during the plan review process. Is that correct? Correct. If if they submitted a plan that did not show either the 150 foot offset or lining up to plan review, that would be one of our initial comments. So, all right, thank you. The other uh, the other comments that we had were, um, and I, I need a brief. Uh, Kevin, are you down there? I need to have a question to ask you. I'm sort of going all over the place because I think there's nothing up here. Kevin. Kevin Moore. Hello. I think they had you muted, Kevin. Uh, maybe. I don't think so. No, you're not muted. We got it. We sure. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Kevin, are you there? Hey, Kevin. Hey. I'm right here. Oh, okay. Can you hear I'm me? Up the, I'm up on the fifth floor. I just can't see you, so it's weird. Um, Kevin, it was my understanding that we have received a letter of agreement from Lock Island. Is that correct? I had uh, spoken with uh, and communicated with Mr. Tim Flood, uh, Lock Island Homeowner Association president, uh, and we had included the requests uh, that uh, he made of us. Uh, in our stipulation letter, uh, which many, many of the items that the, the representative from Lock, or the person from Lock Highland stated today, uh, that's why our letter does specifically include Lock Highland Homeowner Association to be uh, in receipt of the pre-development and post-development lake studies. Uh, Lock Highland Homeowner Association is going to receive our hydrology and engineering and stormwater plans prior to permitting. And we've also uh, committed uh, within the stipulations that they'll receive those uh, with adequate uh, uh, time uh, to respond, have input uh, if they wish, uh, to retain their own engineer to look at it. Uh, in other words, we're giving them the time, uh, the opportunity, uh, as well as the materials so that they can fully evaluate uh, and, and look at that to ensure that we're making all adequate and more than adequate uh, measures uh, to protect uh, uh, their lake, uh, as well as the stream channels and so forth. Uh, those are in our stipulations, uh, and we have uh, included those, which is what was requested of us by the president of the Homeowners Association, whom I had that communication with, who said that's all they were looking for us to do. Okay. And similar, did you have a conversation with the East Cox Civic Association? Yes, we had uh, multiple conversations with the East Cox Civic Association, and based on uh, those conversations and the stipulations and plans that we have submitted, uh, the East Cobb Civic Association did communicate uh, their support for this uh, proposed rezoning. I think they had two additional comments, uh, minor requests uh, with regard to conditions, but uh, otherwise we're, we're supportive, yes. All right. Thank you, Kevin. As, as well as the support of the Highlands at Wesley Chapel Homeowner Association, as, as Mr. Garber uh, explained here earlier. Right. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I think I've answered most of the questions, but I'm going to turn it over with Tony to fix um, our presentation. 
So, do you, oh, well, do you want to present anything else or let me know? No, I'm ready for you to make the motion. All right. Um, do any other commissioners have any comments before we make a motion? Thank you, Fred. Yes. Okay, Fred has a few. Um, is this a perfect time to ask questions of some of the uh, folks who presented? Sure. Okay. Can we get Kevin back up then? Thank you, thank you. Uh, can you tell me, I listened to what you said. You said there were two additional comments from East Cobb Civic Association. I, I couldn't tell whether those were already included in your proposed stipulations or not. Right, the, the two additional uh, minor comments, uh, the uh, one of them was that the uh, district commissioner have approval of final elevations. Uh, we would, this, given this subdivision is going to be um, of the quality and character uh, these homes are almost semi-custom uh, they're not 100 percent spec homes uh, and uh, having elevations to be approved by the district commissioner under these circumstances uh, it is just a very awkward uh, and inadequate way of, of, of addressing that we so we're not agreeable to that because it, we don't want to take home by home to district commissioner depending on which side of the road we're on to uh, to do that and accomplish that when you have an R15 subdivision at this level. Uh, the other uh, request was for district commissioner approval of the final landscape plans, which we don't have an objection to that. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh oh, uh, while you're there, can you give us an answer? I, I can't tell from this plat. Is there a sidewalk on the school side of the street going down? Yes, uh, we're, we'll be installing sidewalks along our frontage uh, that yeah. will connect to the sidewalk southerly of us, which is where the school is. Um, and that sidewalk for the Highlands at Wesley Chapel is at, uh, on that side of the road is there. And I believe it connects all the way to the school, doesn't it? And there's a crossing guard too, Mr. Garber confirmed. I just- Good, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything else from other speakers or? Uh, yeah. Okay, Alice, do you have anything? I guess not. I'll, I'll ask a couple of quick questions. One is there is some talk of the uh, stream buffers being in the front yards of properties. Uh, so maybe Kevin can answer this. We have him come back up. you know how many lots have a stream buffer in the front yard where are we trying to do buffer averaging in those cases or what's just explain that a little bit sure let, let me get the plan and i'll get so i give a specific answer okay okay um to Uh, right now, what we are proposing uh, is that there would be uh, six lots uh, that would involve buffer averaging, okay? Now, understand buffer averaging is allowed by right, it allowed by, as long as you can uh, provide for uh, that additional space along the same stream channel, and it has to be a minimum of the same square footage and provide for that. So what ends up happening is, if you'll see, uh, we're setting aside those areas out uh, to ensure that uh, all of that area uh, that would be impacted is then set aside as open space, as opposed to you're allowed by right as well under the R15 standards to simply extend your lot in all the way to the creek or beyond if you need to and include those areas in the lot. What we're doing is taking those areas out except for a few locations out of the total of 81 and providing for additional space that's not included. That's what buffer averaging is, is you have to then uh, provide for additional buffer in other areas along the same stream channel to accommodate that. So that's what all that is. You're just changing one for one that would otherwise be impacted. So that's what we're doing here uh, and proposing. Uh, it is done uh, all the time, whether you're in a rezoning or not. It's just part of the development standards and ordinances. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. And you're talking about averaging the 50 foot buffer, right? That's correct. That's right. Okay. Okay. And did you talk about the, there was some stuff on DOT about not having decel lanes and things like that. Could you talk about that a little bit? Certainly. Um, and Ms. Diaz from DOT uh, also highlighted it or just referenced it. Uh, we have limited road frontage on Wesley Chapel, as you can see. Uh, so what we're providing for is uh, making sure our entrances align, uh, coming southerly uh, from the top of your screen down. Uh, we are providing for a deceleration lane there. Uh, the problem that we've got is that going north, or not a problem, but it's just there's, there's a lack of right of way going north. Uh, that's adjoining property that's not ours. Uh, and uh, so we'll be doing uh, whatever type of uh, turn lane you know, expansion there that we can, uh, but it certainly cannot accommodate a full diesel lane. If we're just limited by the property that's there, we, we can't acquire private property for that purpose. Okay, and we're not doing turn lanes either, right? Left turn lanes? That's right. Well, that's correct because the existing right of way uh, uh, going in both directions is limited. Uh, and as a result, you cannot fit left turn lanes uh, because you run out of room uh, due to the width of the right of way through there. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not enough, not enough there to accommodate it without going into somebody else's property. Okay. Okay. But, Thank you. Okay, I'll turn it back over to Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Um, just some time ago, uh, because before you ever become a commissioner, you're often involved in zonings, um, watching online. And I remember Chairman Porter uh, started one of his remarks by saying that uh, the first thing we do is consider what would happen if we did nothing. And one of the things that we've had to do is, is I've worked with Judy and, and the applicant, the neighbors, is try to consider uh, the situation and think, you know, what traffic would be like, what development would be like if we didn't resume. And staff's remarks indicate that, that there could be at least 58 homes and potentially more uh, built on this property. So we're, so for this zoning purpose, we're really looking at at the, the margin, the, the difference of adding, adding these additional homes and how that would create an impact. So we, we've looked at that and we're trying to to be fair both to the applicant and to the neighbors as we as we do these stipulations. So with that, uh, I will make a motion that we recommend approval of Z40 uh, subject to the stipulation letter dated 826 and the supplemental stipulation letter dated 831 with the type plan submitted on 831. Uh, additional, stip additional notes to uh, stipulations. Uh, stipulation four in the letter shall be amended to state final renderings subject to district commissioner's approval. Uh, Kevin, I know I heard your your remarks, but uh, I think we all expect that uh, that it's really just in essence the, the the front of the model that we're looking at, and everyone knows that you know brick, stone, and other finishes are always optional and uh, and are not subject to the commissioner's approval. Um, stipulation fifteen. Uh, delete wooden privacy fence and replace with metal fence as an option to the vinyl coated chain link. Uh, stipulation 21, plantings add to stipulation 21, plantings that die within one year of installation shall be replaced by a developer. They're trying to keep notes on everybody else's request, so keep give me just a second here. Let's see. Um, lot number 81 shall have a 40 foot setback from the property line adjoining with the home at 4198 Wesley Chapel Road. Uh, that's done so that every adjoining homeowner has the same benefit of a 40 foot setback. At the moment, uh, we're going to require that the 25-foot state and the 25-foot county undisturbed stream buffers shall remain undisturbed. 
uh, buffer averaging and the impact into the 25 foot county impervious buffer would be allowed according to site plan review. Uh, revised to site plan to show that the buildable areas are outside of 50 foot undisturbed stream buffer. Uh, lot 51 in particular uh, have some concerns there because you're having to cross the creek line in order to show the lot line and get the lot size. Um, so lot 51 and lot, I believe it was 52, you see here. Lot 51 and lot 55 uh, specifically need to be revised to show the buildable area outside of the, uh, the 50 foot buffer. Uh, move the east mailbox kiosk to the amenity area so that that pipe stem can be reduced to a 50 foot right of way. Hopefully that should bring those two lots forward. Uh, recommend a minimum of 20 parking spaces in the amenity area. Uh, this will, as is noted, um, we have people on the other side of Wesley Chapel and we have to expect that those homeowners would be driving to the amenity area. So the amenity area parking needs to be increased for that reason. Uh, the other item, there's been a lot of discussions and a lot of uh, comments about um, stormwater. And as I've had a chance to talk with, with Judy and, and, and Dave Brayton and, and Carl and everybody else involved, you know, it ultimately comes down to the flow. So buffers are nice and, and non-disturbed areas are nice, but it's the flow. How much water is flowing in the stream and how fast is it flowing? Uh, so in order to recognize the impact that this particular development would have, uh, on that, uh, the final stipulation uh, being added is that the first flush water quality management practice requirements should be elevated to the 1.5 inch rainfall event and each larger storm discharge control not to exceed the allowable discharge of the next lower, more frequent storm. Uh, so folks, in, in, in layman's terms, as I understand it, what that is going to mean is that the flow out of the stormwater detention area will be restricted to something less than what would normally be planned with a 35% impervious area. That may mean that the stormwater detention areas have to be enlarged to hold additional water until it can flow out. So that should hopefully provide the reduction in flow that you're looking for that would reduce silt, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, finally, um, let's see, going back to staff, uh, the, 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 staff approval and let's see, that would be uh, the site plan is uh, subject to a district commissioner approving minor modifications. Two, stormwater management division comments and recommendations. Three, water and sewer comments and recommendations. And four, department of transportation comments and recommendations, not in conflict with the site plan and stipulations. And that would be my motion. Second. Okay. We have a second. Uh, further discussion? You have something for it? I do. Okay. I, I guess I'll trust Mr. Tony, but if you want to hop in, I'll, that'd be fine also. Um, first, did anybody give consideration to giving any other neighborhoods uh, any input in the stormwater? Uh, study process under the Lock Islands. There's one other that was included. Uh, no, uh, Lock Highlands and uh, Highlands of Wesley Chapel were both included in that stipulation. The most directly affected. Okay. Are, are there any other subdivisions directly affected? No, Lock Island would be the ultimate where it all goes to. Everybody else just has an, has a uh, has the stream that flows through, and that was the idea behind reducing the stream flow, the storm flow, is okay. that that would manage the stream flow through those other neighborhoods. We did not have any requests or comments from those other neighborhoods on that, but we added that in anyhow. Now I heard Tony. I heard Tony mention final rendering subject to district commissioner approval. Would that include elevations or not? Uh, elevations, yes. Let's change if you want to. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm considering that the front of the house would be the elevation, and that's going to be approved. But obviously, homeowners always pick whether they want brick or stone, or you know what type of finish they actually want on the on the front of the home. So I'm not expecting that that 
somebody's locked into this much brick or this much stone on a particular model of home. Uh, what, what are your thoughts uh, on the uh, on Commissioner, former Commissioner Smith's uh, proposal regarding uh, no buffer averaging? Um, I'm willing to allow the buffer averaging in the uh, in the 25 foot impervious setback area, so that 50 to 75 foot portion. But as I noted, the the 50 foot state and county undisturbed stream buffers should remain undisturbed. That's correct, and we had we talked to our engineers at the county who happened to think who I happen to think are some of the best engineers around. And they agreed with what we are saying. And then uh, I, I didn't write down right fast enough. Can you give me your your uh, criteria again on the on the uh, stormwater runoff from the detention pond? What what the standard is there? You had some very technical detail. Sure, and that was like so. We got that from uh, from stormwater. So a typical, uh, a typical development like this, uh, simply following the 35% maximum impervious surface, uh, would they would do the first, what they call first flush, how much water is held and maintained. And they said on a one inch rainfall. So by going to the next higher level, to a one and a half inch rainfall, it means that the stormwater detention area will have to retain more water so that the amount of flow is less going out than what it would normally be. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay, Alice, do you have any comments? And I'll say she got accidentally booted off the, the virtual when we were going to her before. And I and right now I can't see you on my screen, Alice, so you'll have to pipe in and tell me if you have anything or not. I'm my questions have been answered, so I'm good. Okay, good. And I had one question. Do we have in there that each lot won't have a variance on the impervious surface? In other words, there was, that was a concern brought up. Yeah, sure. they do. No variances. Okay, okay. Will, will some disclosure be made to each purchaser about that fact so they don't come see us in about a year at BZA and ask for the pool variance? Well, anybody can ask for a variance. I think our county attorney can tell you that, but anybody can ask for a variance. We're just saying we're zoning this subject to no variance. Variance, but if they had an individual request, they could certainly do it. Okay. Any other comments or that? So we have a motion and a second. Let's uh, all in favor. And Alice, let me know by voice because I can't see you. Approve. Yeah. Okay, so that's four and those opposed. And with Fred opposed. So it's motion carries four to one. Can I Fred? Fred make a short brief statement? Sure. Yeah, I, I appreciate all the great work you two did. My my uh, uh, my concerns with just as to uh, Commissioner Smith's proposals, I, I would had those been added, I would have supported the, the project, and I appreciate all the great work both of you did. Okay, thank you. Thank you. For you, Fred, that was high praise. <laughs> okay, John, next case. Yes, sir. Next case is rezoning case Z50 of 2020, Mary Kitch Holmes of Georgia, request a rezoning from R20 to RMA. Uh, for the purpose of townhouse dwelling units attached uh, and single family dwelling units detached, and then lots 30 and 31 of the 17th district. The property is located uh, in uh, District 17, land lots 1074 and 1147 for the 19th district. The property is located on the west side of Floyd Road uh, and on the west side uh, and on the north side of White Boulevard. The applicant is present, Mr. Chairman. There is no one here in person to oppose it. However, there are two people here virtually opposing it that wish to speak. So at this point, I hand this over to the applicant. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Parks. Go ahead when you're ready. 
Let me adjust this. Uh, I think <laughs> that was the last time I. There it is. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome, Kevin. <laughs> And I've got a, a presentation. I think Cornelius is going to. There we go. Uh, good morning. For the record, my name is Park Self with Sam Larkin Huff, and I represent Heritage Homes uh, in relation to this rezoning application on, on Floyd Road. Uh, Clay Kirkley with Meritage is, is here, can answer some specific development questions if, if need be. If I'm going to the next slide. Uh, the property is uh, on Floyd Road, um, and it is uh, close to the uh, intersection or south of Glore Road and north of White Boulevard. Uh, really, the kind of the features that, that everyone would re recognize is just north of the Lidl uh, grocery store that recently opened about a year ago. Uh, it's across the road from the middle school. Uh, and obviously, one of the main features that, that uh has some concerns is the there's an old home on the property uh, that was a, a barns home and so uh, it's a, a feature that people notice as they drive down by Floyd Road. The other thing to note about this property is it's at the edge of the uh, activity center with a neighborhood retail commercial going south uh, and then to the north and to the west is a, an existing PRD development uh, that is currently under development and, and selling out rapidly. It's it's Willowcrest Phase One, and this is need to be thought of as Willowcrest Phase Two. Uh, and if I'm going to, to the next slide, uh, the activity center, or excuse me, the land use plan shows this is a uh, medium density residential, which is up to five units per acre. And you can also see going south is all an activity center. Uh, if I'm going to the next slide. Uh, this is the, the site plan and some of the features that I think are real important to point out is number one is uh, Willowcrest uh, subdivision to the north as a cul-de-sac that it ends just north of the subject property. And what we're able to do by doing this development now and with the same developer develop, that developed Willowcrest 1 is combine this into one cohesive development. That allows us to have that uh, road come into our property, uh, connect in, and then we will have a right in, right out at Floyd Road. And then, as you can see, the property uh, has a basically a spine road, if you will, that feeds down to White Boulevard. One of the concerns that we received throughout the process has had to do with traffic. Uh, and obviously, uh, traffic is always a concern in most areas of the county. And so uh, one of the features of this development is being able to tie these two properties together. That would not happen if you had if they didn't develop it at the same time and to be able to have that connectivity, uh, which will allow people to flow through uh, and get down to White Boulevard at times without ever getting on to Floyd Road. And, and it is important to note that the Floyd Road access is limited to a right in, uh, right out. Another feature is also, uh, if you're familiar with the Willowcrest development, it has uh, a nice street, streetscape with single family detached homes along Floyd Road. And we'll continue that same theme as you go south uh, along Floyd Road with that nice streetscape all the way down to uh, the Lidl grocery store. It is important to note that this is a transition property. It transitions from the residential to the commercial and, and uh, you know, it's an opportunity to make that transition coordinated. Go to the next slide. Just a little more close up of, of the site plan and go on the next slide. Now, one of the feedback that we got when we filed or initially filed the application was concern about the the home and uh, it is an attractive home it's a kind of a feature for the community and we received feedback that, that people would like to see the home saved so uh, we could just save it and stick it in the middle of the development and have it um, just not really being a, a central feature and we didn't want to do that and so Meritage's uh, site plan was adjusted to uh, save the home. This gives you an idea of the home location and how the streetscape uh, is opened out to Floyd Road so that you've got the view of the home as it is maintained. And we've got some conditions in our, my letter dated August 31 that detail that we will make the restore the home and keep the historic character of that home. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a picture of the home. Go on to the next slide gives you a good idea of the view 
of the home and, and how important it is to not just save the home, but save the context of the home, the front yard, the, the view that you have, it's attractive. And so we will be maintaining that. And we've agreed that the exterior of the home, we will keep in this uh, same architecture, uh, anything that needs, any restoration that needs to happen, you know, we'll keep the same window sizes and, and same trim level and, and, and such so that the home maintains the historic look that it has now, has always had. Next slide. Uh, the other feature of the of the project includes uh, a lot of amenity areas and being able to uh, have those amenity areas relate to the townhomes as they back up to these amenity areas. And so you can see there the, the historic home up on the right uh, upper right hand area, and then the other uh, areas that are saved that will be you know community areas with different play areas and passive amenities, dog parks, and, and the like. So. Uh, it's a very well thought out plan uh, with street connectivity, but also uh, meaningful open space that will be used by the community. Next, next slide. Uh, you know, looking at this site, um, one of the things that I think is important to note, as I said, this is a transition piece as you go from the commercial at the White Boulevard and intersection and going northwards. Uh, and, and traffic has always been a concern and a question in, in, in relation to the density and such. Uh, I think it's worth noting that this property sits along a bus route. Uh, we create uh, these bus systems and we want them to be used and utilized by the citizens and, and putting people along these bus routes makes a lot of sense. There's also a park and ride lot just north and south of the subject property. Next slide. Uh, this is the homes that will be facing uh, Floyd Road. Again, it's continuing the architectural theme and street theme that you have along Floyd Road by putting the homes facing the road uh, and not having the back of the homes towards the road. So it, it engages the community, makes it pedestrian friendly. Uh, there's a 10-foot wide multi-use path along the front end. So it is, it is a design feature that we think is very important. Next slide. And these are pictures of the townhomes and uh, we've been working with the Mapleton Improvement Coalition. I'm very proud to have their support. Um, and this is a picture of the actual townhomes that are on in the development. Some of the features include the, the carriage style doors with the windows, uh, brick and, and accents and a very attractive look. We've also received some some additional requests on some architectural themes that are detailed in my stipulation letter that we'll be doing uh, to even further enhance that. If I go back to the slide with the uh, zoning map. Again, I think it's very important to understand the uh, location of the property and how it relates to other properties and other zonings as you see Further north, you have an RM8, you have an RA6, you have an RM12 to the south, RSLs. And as I said, this is a transition piece from a PRD to the NRC. Uh, we have applied for an RM8 zoning category, but we would actually think that the most appropriate is to rezone the property PRD so it is consistent with the surrounding PRD. Uh, as I noted in previously, the site plan or the site is in the uh, future land use map as medium density residential. Uh, and when you consider this one PRD development uh, together, we're at 4.7 units per acre totally. Uh, and we continue the theme that the Willow Crest one has and architecturally and, and uh, design wise, this will fit very well into that. As I said, this is a, a key piece and everybody has looked at this piece for things like multifamily or expanding the commercial activity center. So it is a, it is how you, are going to transition from the residential to the commercial and this is a great opportunity that Meritage has this under contract to acquire and to develop and, and incorporate it in its existing development and this is an opportunity that I, one of the reasons why I think Mableton Improvement Coalition supports the application is because this is an opportunity to make that road connection come all the way down through the existing development get down to White Boulevard and create some circulation. I do want to mention too that um, the as traffic has been a continuous theme, 
one of the conditions that we've agreed to is that at the intersection of the lower road uh, this county has uh, authorized the construction of a light a signal at that intersection which is uh, based upon feedback from the community very much needed uh, and we've uh, pledged to fund that light uh, to the tune of $150,000 to help hopefully uh, spur that light installation on. Uh, so we look forward to your review of this application. As I said, the Mapleton Improvement Coalition has worked very hard with us and we're proud to have their support in this application. We're glad that we can preserve the historic home and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Parks. Okay, we'll hear from the opposition now. And I believe they're all virtual. Yes, good good morning. This is Charles Sprayberry with the Cobb County School District. Approval of the petition will cause concerns for CCSD as it will result in an impact on the enrollment of schools already over over capacity specifically in Mableton Elementary School. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We have one more person, Sonia Wheatley. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Commissioners. This is Sonia Wheatley. Um, I do want to thank the applicant, both Meritage Parks and Clay, for working so hard on this. We're pleased to be able to support, see the white, the house that's a landmark saved and, and really to just have such a great working relationship to work out so many details on such a large project. We do have a couple of clarifying points that we would we would request that you incorporate. Um, I have spoken to the app to uh, parks and I do believe we're in agreement. We just want to make sure that that they are clear. Um, the first one is a provision regarding the renderings of the townhomes and the bungalows. The the actual submitted uh, renderings are different they're more red brick and they don't match the existing they're still working on it we hope that we will get revisions prior to the board of commissioners but in lieu of that just to make sure that you know it, it's very very clear as we move forward um, we would request that you make a change to the applicant stipulation number three by removing the second third and fourth sentences and i'll read that quickly um the actual the stipulation is that the single family homes facing Floyd Road um, um, would, will have an attached to our car garage architecture, and this is the part we would love to see revised. The architecture will be consistent with the approved architecture for Willowcrest F attached in Exhibit B. Any elevations will be approved by the district commissioner. We've requested, um, in addition, some more variation, and so we're hoping that will come through. So we would love to, to see you guys revise this to say thus we ask for an architectural we ask for an architectural review committee made up of mick the applicant and county staff with the district commissioners having final approval this committee will re review the front elevations and very very important in relation to the old house being saved in addition to the side elevations of end units um, making sure that it, it preserves the attractive view, you know, view looking into that property. Secondly, um, we would ask that you eat, that we add, I just referenced this, sides of, of bungalows number six and seven facing the historic house, you know, have additional features that will closely match and be subject to the architectural review committee. And then my final point um, relates to the house itself. I know that um, Park said that there were, he did put in some details relating to that, you know, to the exterior to make sure it's consistent. But in the Mick letter submitted uh, to this board, we requested, and it's item number 12, um, which references number five of the applicant stipulations, state that the existing house will be renovated to meet current code uh, ADA, but will remain in keeping with historic character. The main part of this is that we would like to, um, before, during, and, and I'm sorry, before and during the renovation, have an advisory committee comprised of the uh, Mableton Improvement Coalition, friends of the Mabel House, so that they can consult and provide input 
with final plans provided by the district commissioner. We understand that the inside of the house will need significant changes to make it a great community center. And we have no problem with that, but we would like to confirm via committee that the exterior renovations stay within character. And again, we appreciate all the hard work that they've done. Um, we think this is gonna be a great plan and look forward to welcoming new residents to the area. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sonia. <clears throat> that was all the speakers, correct? John? Correct. Okay, with that, we'll close the public comment portion of the hearing. And it's back to this board, and this is the case I'm handling, so I'll go through a, a little bit of information on it. I'll, I'll start with the fact that when we did the zoning for phase one of Willowcrest, which is what you see on the screen right now is PRD, we really tried to see if, if we could get this property included in it because it was a natural uh, in there and at that time the seller wasn't wasn't ready to sell uh you know as, as i believe parks mentioned over the years we've had a number of proposals for commercial kind of uses on this parcel and we pretty well fought them back because it was outside of our neighborhood activity center and just a uh, des desire not to see the commercial sprawl on down floyd road uh, so the natural was that we knew we would end up with some density here because of the location. You know, typically, we try and decrease the intensity of the commercial as we get to residential, but also start with more intense residential right next to the commercial and, and go down from there. Uh, but when we were planning phase one, it was, we pretty much knew our desire was to get uh, townhomes in this phase. We knew it would have to be more dense than just regular single family. Uh, and we weren't able to do it all at, all at one time, but I'm, I'm kind of happy to see they were able to get it while they're still developing phase one, although they're getting nearly fully developed in it. Uh, we have heard some concerns from residents in phase one. What's this going to do to our uh, HOA? And, and is it going to negatively impact our values? And that uh, they have less units, you know, they have smaller density on their part, but that was very intentional. If you notice, we have the townhomes pushed up to Floyd Road and towards the rear as we went down the lower road. We made that much less dense part of it. You can see there's some challenging uh, ponds and streams, and also to keep with the character of what was already going down Glor Road at the time. So it wouldn't be reasonable to expect this piece to be at the same density that that the rear of Phase One's at, for instance, or the overall of Phase what I'll refer to as Phase One because that's, that's the way the developers referred to it. Uh, but I want people to know that, that we thought about that. Now, the light at Glor Road was a big issue in the zoning of phase one. And during the, the zoning, uh, the Board of Commissioners said, you know, DOT was saying, well, it doesn't quite warrant it yet. We'll have to wait until we see when we get these houses on, meanwhile, we have lots of upset neighbors down the road saying, we don't need a light there. And if you have this, you know, we'll just make it worse. Uh, so the Board of Commissioners during that meeting said, why don't we get ahead of the curve and go ahead and do a light? You know, instead of waiting until it's already a big problem, we know we're going to need one there. Let's do it. And I guess at a subsequent meeting, I've been told they, they actually did approve the light, which they wouldn't do at a zoning meeting. But but I've been told the light's actually been approved by the Board of Commissioners. Uh, and in phase one, there was a requirement that the developer of phase one would contribute some money towards that light. Uh, but in this case, with going in with phase two, 
even though phase two doesn't really touch that intersection, they're willing to contribute even more money and, and fund what would probably be just about the whole cost of life, which is good, good for the county. Uh, with regard to the architectures of that, I've talked to Parks about it, and they're working to get renderings, you know, final renderings done before the Board of Commissioners hearing. Uh, but we've had, you know, kind of issues in, in the past with slow, slow turnaround. So what, what I'll do is make in my motion, I'll add that architectural review committee with all the hopes that the BOC can just remove it if they have the final renderings before the BOC. But if they don't, then we'll put that committee in place. Uh, getting approved renderings on phase one took months and months and months of going back and forth and and to some degree marriage really switched the product that they had shown at zoning with what they wanted to actually build and that created real issues so so i do think the committee's important if we don't have the final approved elevations by the boc here uh, and i think that's you know addresses you know we know Schools are always an issue, and I appreciate Charles, you know, commenting, but we have to be, you know, the, the schools really react to the growth that comes. They really don't build capacity in advance of the enrollments in that and, and what's coming. So if we get our zoning based solely on their current enrollments, we probably never rezone anything. Uh, because that's the schools really, they just opened a new school right not too far from here and it's at capacity and it just opened this year. But my understanding is it was built for the exact capacity they expected, you know, with no, with, with no extra uh, enrollment. And of course we've been knowing that we were going to get a lot more approved zonings in this area it's a growth area uh, so that doesn't totally make sense to me on the school board but are there any questions before i go on with the motion from anybody else i don't see anybody raising their hand or i can't see alice but if she doesn't speak up i'll assume she doesn't you good fred okay well, and I do parts reference to it, but it certainly makes sense to delete this to PRD as it's really phase two and they really intend to totally merge and have one, one HOA and really get rid of even the property lines between them, consolidate the properties and then that in the open space. Uh, something we did do too is that I forgot to mention the preservation of the house, but we did hear from a lot of neighbors about the preservation of the house. And some were objecting to the zoning on that one sole basis. And when they found out the house was going to be preserved, they were good with the zoning. Uh, so that was, that was a positive that the developer put in. And, and we did a lot on, on the roadways. I did, before I make a motion, I wanted to bring Amy Diaz on because she was investigating the actual cost of the light at the lower road and see if we mm -hmm. estimated enough money. Are you there? Amy Diaz, DOT. Yes. Were you able to get the estimated cost for that signal? Yes. Um, we have an estimated cost, including breakdown of which parts cost what. So the 150000 will just about cover the signal itself, but the entire cost of the project also includes the, chain, the necessary changes to the roadway and connecting the signal to um, the kicks at Floyd intersection because one of the reasons why we we had some reservations about having a signal at Glor has to do with how close it is to that major intersection. Right. Um, so they would have to be connected so that they operated together. Um, given that the total cost is is coming out to two hundred and eighty six thousand and some change. So two eighty six. Yep. Okay. 
And I appreciate you doing that research. Thank you. No problem. Um, uh, I also heard back that um, we are doing an updated trip generation, uh, an updated signal warrant study based on trip generation since um, we have good counts from when this originally came through uh, and we can grow those up because of, of COVID. We can't take counts right now. Okay. Okay, good. Good. And do they have any projection on when the signal might be installed? We do not. Um, okay. It was, as, as you referenced, it was not warranted when we looked at it last time. So they're taking a look at it now to see if it's warranted now. Well, they're taking a look at it with all this extra trip generation to see if it's warranted now. Okay, okay. But I know the Board of Commissioners, I've been told, has already actually approved the installation of it, correct? I have not been told it, it's been approved. I do know that um, Lisa Cupid does support this traffic signal, uh, but but as far as I know, it has not been approved. Um, DOT recommended waiting until more traffic had um to that area to see if it no warrants at that time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Parks to come back up real soon, uh, real quick. Hey, Parks. I just wanted to ask you on the cost of the signal. Yeah. Uh, now that we actually have some numbers, because we kind of threw in 150, thinking that would be the cost of of it probably yeah uh is your client willing to re revise the number since they're now saying it's 286 to do the whole thing yeah i just talked to my client and, and what we would agree to is go up to 200 on in my step letter is 150 okay um, and and subject to you know we'll, we'll go back and review it and see uh, i think some of the road improvements were, have already been done uh, i know we added some some turn lanes when we did the fir first phase so Hopefully, um, some of that may may already be done, but we'd be willing to go up to 200 at this point. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. With that, I'll go ahead with my motion. Uh, with regard to Z50, I make a motion to recommend deletion to PRD, subject to all the following. All staff comments and recommendations not otherwise in conflict. And I want to note in particular the historic preservation comments and recommendations to be included. Uh, the site plan received August 31st, 2020 with the following modifications. Addition of a 10 foot landscape buffer behind units 82 through 89 and units 111 through 129 along the western property line currently shown, which may be consolidated in the future, but we know where it is. Uh, and the remaining home to exist because it's grayed out on the site plan, but it's going to remain. Uh, all stipulations in the letter from Parks Huff received August 31st, 2020 not otherwise in conflict with the following changes. Item number 10, which referred to the buffer I just said, uh, be corrected to behind lots 82 through 89 and 111 through 129. Item number 11 be revised to 200,000, which is the signal we just talked about. And item number 17, I'm gonna add uh, only incidental storage that does not interfere with the parking of vehicles shall be allowed in the garages and the restriction to be included in the CCNRs. Okay, then the existing house at 4730 Floyd Road will be renovated to meet current building code, fire code, and ADA standards for a neighborhood amenity. But remain in keeping with its historic character for the life of the structure. The view of the house from Floyd Road will remain unobstructed, so we're not going to put anything in front of it. The exterior appearance of the front and sides of the house will remain the same as it appears today, and that was shown in by, by the applicant in the picture including but not limited to the paint and roof colors and materials, windows and door locations and size and amount of trim materials. 
to the extent possible, any changes to the exterior required to meet code requirements shall be made to the rear of the house in a manner not visible from Floyd Road. The interior may be modified to meet code requirements and desired layout for the amenity. If we want to make sure it's a usable amenity for that subdivision so that we'll maintain it. Uh, before and during the initial renovation, a renovation review committee shall comprise will be comprised of one member from each uh, the applicant, Mableton Improvement Coalition, the Friends of Mabel House, and Cobb County Community Development Agency. And that's established to review and approve the exterior renovation plans with final approval of the plans by the district commissioner and restoration to be uh, of the home to be complete prior to the issuance of the 94th certificate of occupancy for the development so that gives them a long time but we make sure it gets done uh, and uh, with regard to the trail connecting phase one and phase two near the dog park the trail to be completed prior to the issuance of the 150th certificate of occupancy this part of that was supposed to be done in phase one and it hasn't been done yet uh, they're not totally done but i want to make sure there's a time frame uh, applicant to provide revised renderings at least one week prior to the board of commissioners hearing Rendering should address the points in the letter from Mableton Improvement Coalition dated August 26, 2020. If the renderings are not provided by said deadline, an architectural review committee is to be established with one member from the applicant, one from Mableton Improvement Coalition, and one from Cobb County Community Development Agency. The committee to review and approve all renderings with the district commissioner having final approval and with that that is uh, my motion i would like to make a second okay thank you i appreciate it okay alice and is there any further comment and say how proud i am that we're preserving Okay, good. Yes, I, I think the community is very happy, and I'm glad we were able to work that out with the applicant. And and part of being able to work that out was giving them maybe a little bit more density than we might have otherwise, you know, just because there's going to be significant cost in renovating that house. And also, they're contributing a lot more money to the signal than they would have uh, at Glore Road. So... We worked out what I think is a couple win-wins uh, for the community there. Okay. Any further comment? With that, we'll call the question. All in favor, raise your hand. And Alice, if you can tell me what your vote is. Oh, I had my video back on. I'm a yes. Okay, thank you. You're just off my screen, so I can't see you unless you're talking. <laughs> okay, so, so that looks like the motion carries five to zero. And with that, I bet you some people probably need a short break. So let's take a 10 minute break and be back here 10 minutes. Thank you. Put fire sprinklers in your short break.
Okay. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to the Planning Commission hearings. With that, I'm going to turn it back to John Peterson for our next case. Right. Thank you, sir. Our next case is present case is Z62 of 2020, Embry Development Company, LLC. Again, to request the rezoning from R20 and the NRC to PVC for the purpose of mixed use. The land lots 77, 78, 155, and 156 of the 18th District. The property is located on the west side of Mamba Parkway, uh, the southwest side of Old Powder Springs Road, the north side of Boggs Road, the north side of Patricia Lane, uh, on the north side of Lynn Circle, on the east and west sides of Millam Drive, on the south side of Sun. So Boulevard, which is not open, and on the east and west sides of Gloria Circle, not open. Yeah, it is present. Uh, there is no one here virtually or in person to oppose this case. So at this point, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 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 So, uh, hey, you ready, Kevin? And I think we talked about you're just going to give us an update <laughs> from our last hearing instead of the full blown uh, thing. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Planning Commissioners. Kevin Moore here on behalf of the African Embry Development. Uh, and yes, uh, thanks for thanks for reminding me. But yes, I'm going to be doing a, an abbreviated uh, presentation. We gave a full presentation at your prior. Uh, meeting this month. Uh, we received, I think, very positive feedback from that as well as some, uh, some very specific comments about uh, what you wanted to see as a planning commission on a revised plan. And so what I want to present to you is that revised plan. Uh, we have also, uh, as part of this uh, uh, being continued to this month, uh, we updated our stipulation letter uh, that was submitted August 26th and then further updated it again with a uh, yet another revision of the plan that was submitted yesterday. So the plan you're seeing on your screen uh, is dated uh, last revised and submitted August 31. Uh, and what we've now done is present to you, again, a, a mixed residential and commercial project uh, for uh, this uh, proposed uh, PVC zoning. Uh, and to update you, what, starting at the top, you have Old Powder Springs Road, and Mableton Parkway intersection. Uh, that's where we have placed the uh, commercial component, which is a 13,500 uh, square feet commercial component. Uh, we put some, some pretty heavy restrictions on it. Uh, but to the left, you'll see one of the main entrances to the entire uh, proposed development on Old Powder Springs Road. Uh, we've now confirmed, uh, made sure that that meets the distance separation to the intersection of Mableton Parkway. Uh, in addition, we've identified that as a right in right out location at Old Powder Springs Road. Uh, kind of continuing further on Mableton Parkway as you come south uh, down on your screen um, it is the first uh, access into the uh, into the village. Uh, that access now does uh, show the deceleration lane as well as you pull in and turn back to your right uh, as opposed to that being an alley, now it's a full street that feeds back into the commercial area as opposed to an alley. Again, continuing on Mableton Parkway, we have now ensured that we have identified the second deceleration lane into the second access point uh, for the uh, uh, proposed village. Uh, again, identifying that as appropriate location. Now turning to the other item uh, that was a importance during the discussion uh, and recommendation from the Planning Commission and comments from last month. Uh, it's going to be, you're going to find it in the middle of your screen, which is Milam Drive. Uh, that's an existing uh, road, county road that stretches from Old Powder Springs to Boggs Road. Uh, kind of winds down through the middle of this uh, site plan and our proposed development. Uh, previously, we, we did not have any uh, access from our call the Mableton Parkway oriented portion of this village to Milam Drive or any of the surrounding streets that connect to Boggs Road. And that's important. That's where you, you can go going back down towards Boggs and then out that way uh, you get to the school. Uh, in addition, uh, there's some other good reasons to have access uh, to the rear of the front portion of this pro project uh, so that it allows the single family residential that's detached off of Milam easy access to the amenity and commercial without having to get on the Mableton Parkway. 
Uh, and so we have now provided for access there on Milam, uh, direct access uh, to this project. The other access points, any other access point involves crossing a stream. Uh, this is the only place that you can access Milam Drive from this property without crossing a stream, which you obviously don't want to do. And uh, that's why we've been able to take that into account, provide for the open space, provide for that additional access to Milam Drive. We think overall really improve uh, the circulation uh, and usability for the future residents of this village, uh, as well as the public. This allows for better traffic circulation. You know, more access is better circulation. More access is better traffic movement uh, for the residents here, uh, future residents, existing residents, as well as those uh, visiting uh, their friends and family or meeting at the uh, commercial restaurant uh, we will have opportunities for at the corner. And this is a, uh, we think is an exciting project. Uh, this particular area uh, along Mabel and Parkway has not seen redevelopment or development of any kind that, uh, that would inject into uh, the community uh, uh, a freshness. Uh, has just not seen it in many, many, many years. Uh, what we're proposing is a well thought out village concept uh, that contains true commercial space. Uh, it takes out uh, com existing commercial space that's been a long, uh, long-standing uh, sore point with the community, uh, injects great new residential, uh, mixed residential components from townhomes to courtyard detached homes uh, to single-family detached homes on lots. Uh, it does so uh, keeping the overall project density under five units per acre at 4.7 units per acre, providing tremendous amenity and open space opportunities for future residents. Uh, and we think it's a fantastic project. Uh, and uh, we've worked very hard with Mableton Improvement Coalition. We want to thank them for their participation and work with us. Uh, and we believe with this final site plan and our stipulations of August 26 that uh, this is an excellent project. And my discussions with, with Chairman Porter, I know there's a couple of updates he wants to make to this letter that we've discussed, uh, which are agreeable to us. Uh, and with that and those additional comments, uh, we respect the request your recommendation for approval of this outstanding project. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kevin. And I believe there is no opposition, correct? None. And Mr. Chairman, we did have one person uh, jump in. I think uh, Sonia Wheatley wants to say a few words about it uh, on the opposition's time. Okay, well, we'll get it to the opposition. Then. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Sonia Wheatley again with the Mables and Improvement Coalition. Just wanted to really thank everybody for the hard work on this. Uh, Kevin has really done a great job explaining this is an area that's sorely in need of some new growth and village. So we're excited about the project. Um, we're excited about the elevations we've seen. It definitely is going to inject some positive positivity and hopefully spur some new growth in the area. Um, the only request that we would have in addition is that corner portion, which is going to be the new resident, the new commercial portion, that there be some kind of uh, some date set in stone for removal of um, a pretty unattractive business on the corner, um, just to make sure that it starts to to show that change in this area. Other than that, again, we're really pleased with all the hard work that's been done, and again, really look forward to having some great new neighbors and seeing the change on this corner. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And with that, we'll close the public comment portion of the hearing. And it's back to this board. And this is my case, so I'll try and cover it very quickly. Uh, and Simon, you get one of the, the points, the removal of that old uh, commercial building is very important to the community. And what's currently in the stip letter says that we'll remove it within 90 days of their closing on the property because they don't own the property yet. Uh, but we want to make sure that, you know, what if they never close on it? It's a stipulation for it to be removed. So we're going to say 180 days from BOC uh, decision, whichever comes first. Uh, just to make sure we get that. Does anybody have any questions or comments before I start making a motion? I don't see any or hear any. Uh, okay. And I'm just going to jump on to the motion because I think we've solved the problems and we've talked about them in other hearings. So uh, 
With regard to Z62 of 2019, I make a motion to recommend approval subject to all the following. All staff comments and recommendations not otherwise in conflict. The site plan received August 31st, 2020. Uh, all stipulations in the letter from Kevin Moore dated August 26, 2020 and August 31st, 2020, not otherwise in conflict with the following changes to the August 26 letter. In section one, item three, delete by incorporating brick or painted brick into at least 50% of the front uh, or facing elevations. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, item number one, uh, section one, item number 12, add after subject property for 180 days from BOC uh, final zoning decision, whichever comes first. And then in section three, item number three, it currently reads uh, the sentence to the extent there is conflict between the attached renderings and the Mableton Parkway design guidelines and the rendering shall control. And we want to change that to the de design guidelines shall control uh, because the renderings aren't to the design guidelines or even close at this point. Uh, and then stipulation number four, all signage visible from Mapleton Parkway shall adhere to the design guidelines. Uh, number five, the commercial buildings and all townhomes fronting Mapleton Parkway uh, shall be subject to the design guidelines and shall have uh, three-sided architectural features that that adhere to the design guidelines, including but not limited to the requirement for 75% work on the elevations. The rear elevations not visible from Mableton Parkway are not required to adhere to the design guidelines. And the final thing is we'll recommend that for the consent agenda for the Board of Commissioners, and that's my motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right, guys, second from Judy. Any further discussion? What my friend has some? Just, just briefly, I uh, just has a question to you about uh, on page 47, the DOT staff has identified numerous improvements that will be needed as a result of the pro proposal to mitigate negative effects of traffic. Uh, are you confident the stipulations go a long way towards mitigating those concerns? You're right, I think it's 47. Okay. I, I really am because what we've done is, you know, is added the diesel lanes, we've added the connection to Milam. Uh, now on Milam, there was some talk about uh, whether Milam needs to be upgraded and the one, the curve needs to be, an existing curve needs a little bit of work. But what I went out there myself was I went out and actually measured the pavement and it appears like in most places, if not all, the pavement is the right width already, but the county has allowed vegetation to grow considerably onto the pavement and made it feel like it's a narrow road where there's really pavement under a lot of that vegetation. Uh, so I, I don't think that's going to be a, a big issue and, and with with the DOT comments, I think we have all of these things addressed. And my second question will be, will, will there be sidewalks on my own drive? There will, they'll have to put sidewalks on, well, let's bring Amy Diaz to answer that. That may be the best thing, because I want to make sure I don't say something wrong, because we've just added in a Amy Diaz, DOT. And the question is on my level, I assume they'll have to put sidewalks on their window frontage. Correct. Um, that would be our recommendation. Uh, we we have some recommendations that are not included in our stipulation or their site. Okay. Do you want to add some recommendations 
because I know we've changed a lot in the plan to remove. Correct. So um, we have a number of recommendations that have to do with the dedication of right away. Uh, so um, because most of those roads, with the exception of Milam, don't have sufficient right away. Right. Um, so they did adjust the um, back somewhat on Old Powder Springs Road, but it's still within 250 feet tangent distance of the, of the intersection on Babelton Parkway. Right. So, but it, but it shut down to run right out of the way. Okay, that that's fine. Um, and then we we had had um, a different set of comments when we had their original site plan that uh, talked about the potential for accessing Milam, where <clears throat> we talked about giving improvements to that roadway. So I know that you say you got went out there and measured the pavement. Um, I would like them to work with us. Perhaps we can get them to clear the vegetation back to, uh, and if it's possible, maybe cut some vegetation back to get a better sight distance on that on that curve. Right, right. I think that was in your comments. I think they're agreeable to that. Uh, right. And they don't, and, but, but that may not be the comments that are in the book. So let's make sure that, that the motion includes those revised DOT comments uh, that specify the, the work to be done on my own. They, they, uh, yeah, they don't have any addressment of the uh, DOT comments in their stip letter. So, if uh, if it's done not otherwise in conflict, those won't be included. Okay. Well, let's make sure that we have those included. And Amy, do the DOT comments address it all? Sidewalk. My concern is just coming down mile and going to school. So uh, school is closed. Uh, I recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. They, they do have a school in that area, but it's been relocated. Um, right. We recommend, it, our, our number 11 recommendation is recommend coordination with Cobb DOT to improve visibility slash safety for the Milan Road curve north of the single family access driveway. The specific mitigations that implemented will be negotiated as part of the plan review process. Associated development improvements may include guard rail on the eastern side of Milan Drive and or vegetation clearing to improve sight lines. So um, now that they have an access on Milam from the, the other side of the roadway, that's very critical because they're going to have more traffic on the road than, you, than we originally thought. So, so you're telling me these plans do or do not include any sidewalks? Correct. I, not that I see. But, but, you would, but that would be a DOT standard to put sidewalks, right? Correct. So, so we'll I, make I sure... Yeah, so I'll revise the motion to, to include sidewalks on the Milam frontage. Cool. That would be that would be good. Yeah, because previously they hadn't accessed Milam, and so they're, they we did not require that because it's a local roadway. But now that they're accessing it, we would would request that. Okay. Okay. So motion uh, revise the motion to include the comments that Amy just read in and the. Sidewalks on the bottom frontages. And second, yeah, with that, and Kevin's got a comment. Okay. Yeah. For the sidewalks on the bottom frontage, uh, that's where there's uh, there's various points where there's some stream impact against the road. I just want to make sure that could be coordinated with DOT to handle that. We don't want a two hundred thousand dollars sidewalk segment that only goes ten feet. Okay. Uh, balance that out with DOT, which they're using and typically very good about. Yes, okay. and um, any sidewalk would have to be protected by curb and gutter, so that would definitely be something we would be negotiating along that curve. Sure. The, area. The, the rest of uh, DOT's comments as it relates to Milam are, are agreeable. We, we have reviewed those and, and checked it out ourselves, and we, we feel very confident we can improve that situation with what we're doing. Okay, okay, good. So we'll make note to, to Kevin's concern about sidewalks and streams and work that with DOT so it doesn't become cost uh, prohibitive. Thank you for that accommodation. Okay, okay, and second, okay, with those changes, 
Yes. Okay. Well, with that, are there any other comments or discussion? Not seeing or hearing any. Let's call. Did you have something, John, or are you just getting prepared? Getting ready for the next one, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, with that, we'll call the question. All in favor, raise your hand. And then, Alice, if you can give me your voice vote. Yes. Okay. So, that carries five to two. Okay, next case, John. Yes, sir. Rezoning case Z42-120, Cumberland Mall, LLC, request rezoning from PFC, RRC, and CRC to RRC for mixed-use development and land lots 912, 913, 948, and 949 of the 17th District. The property is located on the south side of Cobb Parkway, on the north side of Cumberland Boulevard, and on the west side of Anchors Mill Road. There is no one here virtually opposed to this case. There is no one uh, in person opposing this case. And the applicant is present ready to make this presentation. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Mr. Moore. Whenever you're ready, Phil. I'm sorry. No, not a problem at all. I'm just waiting for them. They're, they need to, uh, if they could, pull up the uh, the presentation materials okay. when they get a chance. Sometimes there's a little lag there. Don't worry, I started the clock, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> ACP is the presentation coming up. <clears throat> there we go. We're getting a picture of us. There we go. There we go. Outstanding. Thanks, Cornelius. All right, well, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I think we're ready uh, to present. Again, I'm Kevin Moore. I'm uh, very pleased to present this application for rezoning. Uh, as the uh, first slide shows you, this is here on behalf of Brookville Properties and Cumberland Mall uh, for a proposed uh, redevelopment project of just a portion of Cumberland Mall. And I think it's important before we even go through the details. Uh, you know, Cumberland Mall continues to thrive and be successful uh, and is in a, just a vital, important part uh, of the Platinum Triangle and area around in and around the Galleria uh, for what forms uh, what I consider to be Cobb County's downtown. Uh, that's Cobb County's urban core and urban center. Uh, and Cumberland Mall continues to be a vital, important cog and a vital, important piece of that urban center. Uh, what's being proposed today is a, is a redevelopment of a portion, only 17 acres that are involved uh, in this proposed redevelopment. Uh, but what it is setting the stage for uh, is how Cumberland Mall specifically and the area generally uh, will continue to be redeveloped for the next 50 years. Uh, when Cumberland Mall first went in in the early 70s, it set the stage for this area as our first regional mall. Uh, and now what we're trying to do with others uh, are setting that stage for the next 50 years. You can even see on this first slide what we're proposing uh, is a, this is a visual uh, from Cumberland Boulevard, which uh, you know, is the other side of the mall from the COP 41 side. And when we start to go through this, you start to keep these visuals in mind that you can really see how this will come together in a variety of different uh, uh, places. Uh, but currently, this property is owned Plan Shopping Center, a PSC, RRC, and CRC. Uh, and we are proposing that uh, it all be naturally re rezoned to regional retail commercial. We can start uh, 
I've slipped through these uh, slides at this point to really be able to tell the story of what's being proposed. And you can just go to the next slide. I think everybody knows where Cumberland Mall is. Uh, as we discussed uh, and presented, uh, this is the site. This is Cumberland Mall, US Highway 41, Cobb Parkway is across the top of your screen. Interstate 285 is on the left-hand side of your screen. Cumberland Boulevard is on the bottom of your screen and Acres Mill Road is on the right-hand portion of this screen. What we call an impact area is what we're saying is the 17 acres of redevelopment area uh, that is proposed for this project. I go into the next slide. Uh, we'll start to detail out exactly how and what we're proposing uh, for this uh, redevelopment of a portion of Cumberland Mall property. Uh, first, I just want to direct your attention to the middle of this site plan uh, where it says Dick Sporting Goods and Golf Galaxy Planet Fitness in round one lower level. You know, that's the existing end of Cumberland Mall as we know it uh, today. Those are new tenants. Uh, as you can see, those they uh, arrived uh, and are filling that space out. Uh, and that's exciting for, for the mall, exciting for uh, what that brings. So you can again see, this is not about a mall being dead. What this is, is about a mall continuing to evolve and be dynamic uh, in so doing for the future. Uh, but to what we're proposing, starting at the top right hand uh, corner of your screen, which is the intersection of uh, Cobb Parkway and Acres Mill, uh, there what we're proposing to do uh, is build an office tower of about 10 stories tall over a parking deck. Uh, that office tower would be 222,500 square feet. Uh, and then a portion of that would also involve a retail component. Uh, you can see the two retail blocks there, additional retail blocks uh, that are there uh, in that northern quadrant or section or northeast section uh, of the project. Uh, we continue to utilize the existing access on the Acres Mill, just kind of working through this project. Uh, going south, now we have what's labeled the east section, also on Acres Mill, but this time at Acres Mill in Cumberland Parkway. There's a proposed multifamily of 315 units total or max uh, multifamily uh, to bring a residential component directly to the mall's doorstep and, in fact, create an interactive uh, environment uh, for both the existing mall tenants, the existing mall services, restaurants, and retail, as well as adding to that uh, uh, this uh, additional uh, redevelopment and elements uh, for the overall mall property uh, and being able to incorporate that residential component, uh, creating additional actual green space uh, areas uh, around that multifamily component. Uh, as we come along Cumberland Boulevard, uh, you'll see that the next segment, and this is where we get, where I think it becomes extremely interesting uh, and, and very, very beneficial for the community, the county, uh, and for the mall itself. Uh, this next section proposes another office building uh, that would be a, a approximately 10 stories. But here it's 222,500 square feet over a parking structure. But what we've included with this after long, long discussions, this has been in plans for over a year, uh, is uh, a new bus transfer uh, station or bus terminal station. Uh, currently across Cumberland Boulevard, if you've been to this area, is the bus transfer station um, that is essentially just a couple of lanes, if that, uh, that's on Cumberland Boulevard that uh, where people can you know, get off a bus and get on another one. What we're proposing is, is an actual facility for that to, to take place uh, with uh, 10 bus bays, uh, as well as a minimum of 500 parking spaces that will be in this uh, parking structure and parking deck that will be part of uh, a Cobb County DOT project uh, and part of building that out uh, would include uh, the president you know, include the committed minimum of 500 parking spaces as can be used by the public uh, for park and ride or other uses as deemed best by the county as part of that overall structure uh, also moving then further to the left on your screen uh, you'll see the the, the firehouse uh, we are also including within this plans provisions uh, for that prop specific property uh, to be the new fire station location uh, we have worked very diligently with your fire department uh, they have been looking for years in this area for a much needed location for a fire station and unable, but unable to find an appropriate location ideally this is the location this is what they've always wanted but not been able to, to get there this puts them in an ideal location uh, for emergency services and other services that they need to provide uh, to make sure they're covering our residents and businesses in this area and so that's where we would incorporate uh, the fire a fire station that would be a Cobb County project for which they have long desired. Uh, you can see that what we've created through all these different sections uh, is 
that they're seamlessly interactive, uh, and that's obviously very intentional uh, to create uh, the type of environment uh, that's beneficial, not specifically to them all, but beneficial to the community and all those who come through this area and want to use this area and work in this area, play in this area, and enjoy uh, being uh, here at Cobb County's downtown. Uh, moving to the next plan, I want to kind of now take you through how this will evolve. Uh, this is a picture showing you uh, the existing conditions. Uh, we'll just kind of go through these and you'll see this redevelopment come to life, come into the next um, uh, slide. Here we are at the intersection of Cumberland uh, Parkway and Acres Mill, and you'll see uh, the multifamily building uh, arising, uh, as well as you can see the green space I was speaking of. Next, next slide, you're good, is uh, a shot of the intersection of 41 on your left and Acres Mill, and you'll see that new office tower that would go in that location that sits down and you see how it's oriented towards the multifamily. Go to the next slide. Uh, now you see this, the additional section we were talking about. Now you're seeing the view from Cumberland Parkway and you're really seeing now how that bus terminal, bus transfer station there on the first level, street level uh, of Cumberland Parkway under the parking structure, how that would be oriented. You have the parking structure above it, which has over 1,500 spaces, 500, at least 500 of which will be Cobb County spaces. You have the office tower again uh, placed on top and to the left. Uh, you see the fire station now coming into full view. And, and what you're getting with all of that is, is now you can see how that all fits in, how it will look. But I think it's also vitally important for both you and anybody else watching this to understand is that these pieces can come together. And that's part of the why it took over a year to, to have the design uh, put together to have the meetings with the county so we could all understand how does this unfold. Well, it, it unfolds by design elements which can be done independent of each other. There's no timing associated with this. The timing is associated with what can be done um, based on where funding is available for county projects uh, and where market funding available for our projects. Uh, the, the fire station can be built right away uh, if the county so chooses. I know that they're very interested in moving forward immediately with that from a funding standpoint. Uh, funding for the bus term, bus transfer station uh, is in the works uh, and will be forthcoming, but that includes a lot of funding uh, from uh, various sources that DOT will be continuing to work on. Uh, and that can be built at the appropriate time. It doesn't need to wait on our office tower. Our office tower is planned and designed. It can come in. Uh, even after that's completed, it can be it can come in afterwards. So all of these pieces, as we just as I've just discussed, can come in at the appropriate time without having to be dependent or interdependent on something else occurring first. And that's and that's intentional, uh, so that all of this can come together uh, appropriately, so that the benefits that are present with this plan uh, can be enjoyed by all at, and be and be uh, appropriately designed and incorporated. The uh, project, as you would might expect, went through a DRI, extensive DRI process, uh, for which received many favorable comments as a result of that and the Greta comments as well. I'm here, I can answer any questions that you may have. We also have representatives from Kimberly Horn, Ms. Kate Triplett, Mr. John Walker here that can answer any technical questions. And we certainly respectfully recommend uh, your recommendation or request your recommendation of approval. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And just to check, I think we had no opposition, correct? No opposition online. Okay. And with that, we'll close the public comment portion of the hearing. And this is in District 2, so we're going to let Tony Waybray lead the discussion. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, a couple of quick questions for DOT, Amy and Abby. Amy Diaz, DOT. Uh, have you had a chance now to review the um, the stip letter as well as all of the um, all of the DRI comments? And you, where do you stand on that? Um, so we were an integral part of the DRI process, and um, we do recommend the the recommendations that came out of that. Um, I have not double check their stuff later I'm, I'm doing it now but um that all of it are included but as they are there are conditions that they are conditioned with um arc and greta as well as the county okay 
All right, thank you, uh, Dave Braden. Do we have Dave or Carl on the line? Uh, you got Carl on the line. Carl, great. Um, one of the variants is noted is the um, is is the impervious surface. But uh, looking at the plans, it looks as perhaps we're improving our our ratio compared to what's existing. But how are we on stormwater uh, management and retention? Well, they, yeah, they do look like they're improving the uh, impervious uh, surfaces compared to what's out there today. This would still fall under the redevelopment, which would require some detention and um, and to not to see the um, capacity of the uh, infrastructure that they'll be tying into. Okay, and is that uh, is that accommodated underground or offsite? Uh, it would probably be underground, I would think. Um, it'd kind of be up to the design engineer. Okay. All right, good stuff. That's all, thank you. Okay. Uh, Kevin. Uh, yes. Right are you still there? I'm certainly, certainly am. Uh, great. All right, so we got a number of variances. Could you perhaps go through the variances and how they... Uh, relate to the design of this of this project? Uh, certainly be happy to. And yes, there are a number of variances, but you would, uh, you know, generally speaking, you would expect that with a, with a redevelopment project of this nature. Um, the first, I think the best one is just for example, uh, the one you just uh, asked about in regards to impervious surface variance. Right now, uh, it's 100% impervious. Uh, they're, they're nearly 100% impervious, uh, this, this area. Um, and we're actually seeking a variance, though, because we are rezoning with the redevelopment to increase the allowable impervious surface from 80% to 87%, but that's actually a reduction by at least 10% of impervious, uh, for example. Uh, in addition, we have a number of setback variances. Um, those setback variances are necessary in order to properly position uh, uh, the component parts of uh, this redevelopment, which is a tremendous mixed-use effort. Uh, part of, uh, and if you uh, take the time, but I'll let you know, the ARC Atlanta Regional Commission is part of their development of regional impact study, uh, references a number of regional studies that have been completed, all of which recommended uh, that a redevelopment of this type uh, and the, building, the placement of the buildings uh, be street-centered, uh, that is, bring those buildings to the street. Uh, don't have buildings clustered in the middle with parking areas all out towards your street frontages. Uh, rather, create parking structures, bring structures to the street uh, to engage with the street. That's what we have done here. So that's in, in alignment with and consistent with those regional studies that have been conducted and their comments and recommendations. And our project absolutely complies with that and is consistent with that. But that's why you get setback variances that we have asked for here is because you've got to engage that street. You can't have a bus transfer station that sits, you know, 50 feet off or more to provide parking. Rather, why don't we bring that to the street so it can be immediately engaged and create that pedestrian environment and create an easier environment for bus transfer. Same thing with the fire station, same thing with the other components, the office, the multifamily. All of that needs to be oriented and engaged on the streets and have everything else internal to create an appropriate look. Otherwise, you get 1970s uh, mall in the middle surrounded by acres and acres and acres of parking, and that's not an appropriate look. All right, great, All right. thank you. Sure. Um, other commissioners, do any other commissioners have questions for staff or for Kevin? Yes, I'm afraid. Just a few. I think Fred has a few here. Uh, uh, it, is Kevin still up? Uh, at, at, this point, at, at this point, in light of everything that's just happened with COVID, what, what's the realistic chance of these two office towers getting built? Well, I think there's an extremely realistic chance of, of them being being built. Uh, they were no, never going to start tomorrow. Um, so uh, very much uh, we think that there is a – and we've discussed that, and I've discussed that with them, and uh, we think there's an extremely realistic chance as it moves forward I'm certainly, uh, I'm hopeful uh, that while COVID's been here too long, it's not going to be here forever. 
uh, and there will be a need uh, for uh, continued need uh, to have office space and that type of space centered in uh, Cobbs downtown. Okay. Uh, so the Dix is certainly already a big improvement over the uh, Sears um, that, that was there. Is there, is, there uh, is, is part of the idea uh, in the architectural plans to encourage kind of an interior street community type of feel um, somewhat similar to the battery? Is that the idea of repurposing the mall towards something where it's kind of a livable community in the end? Yes. When you, If you look at our we went back to the site plan. What you can see is internally, uh, you have streets oriented, uh, running, uh, providing connectivity, providing a much more uh, plaza-like experience with other retail uh, opportunities. There's nearly, uh, thir it's just over 31,000 square feet of retail, additional retail that will be first floor retail in a couple of the buildings. You can see how they're oriented. If you look, the one parking field in the middle, that's uh, that has to remain because that is parking uh, for uh, the mall, and that has to remain for the viability and by agreement with obviously with those tenants uh, remains. Uh, but you can see how uh, around that center parking field, uh, which you have is engagement through a new sh a new street system uh, with uh, retail restaurant buildings. Those are those dark blocks um, adjacent on the northern section. Uh, then you have retail underneath the first floor retail on the lower office portion, as well as at the uh, multifamily section. So you've got that creating that uh, plaza-like experience uh, through throughout that interactivity. Well, this, is, this project also certainly has superior access to at least two interstate highways right here, correct? So it's ideally suited for regional designation. No doubt about it. I just want to know where the train connects into it. Just <laughs> in, Kevin. <laughs> you do realize there was a fair out there this weekend and it'll be gone now. I guess they won't be able to set up there. That's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, does anybody else have questions? Okay, I guess it's back to you, Tony. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kevin, one, whoops, where'd Kevin go? <laughs> He's yes, sir. All right, so one quick question, just because we've had a couple of comments about uh, about access and stuff. I wanted to confirm that uh, all of the DOT, ARC, GRT, GRTA, et cetera, et cetera, requirements and requests for transportation improvements, all of those are agreed and included in your stip letter. Yes, the, the, it's really the, it's, they're from the Georgia Regional Transportation Authority. The Greta comments are included. They're, they're on the site plan and are included. And those and those are associated with various aspects, but yes, they're included. Okay, great. All right, with that, I would like to make a motion that uh, we recommend approval of Z42, subject to the stipulation letter dated 826, as well as the site plan submitted on 826. Uh, that would also include the, uh, the recommendations and, and references to the DRI plan. Uh, also uh, approved subject to, let's see, variances as stated in the zoning comments, Fire Department comments and recommendations, stormwater management division comments and recommendations, water sewer comments and recommendations, and Department of Transportation comments and recommendations. All of those to be included. That is my motion. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, second from Alice. Any further discussion? Not hearing or seeing any, let's call the question. All in favor? Alice, if you can say yours. Yes. Okay, passes five to two for approval. Okay, thank you. John, what's next? I think we only have one case left. Yes, sir. Rezoning case Z46, Vladimir Popov requests a rezoning from R20 to HI for uh, open storage and parking. And then Lot 22 of the 18th District. 
This property is located on the west side of Joe Jefferson Boulevard, north of Humphreys Hill Road. Uh, there are four people uh, in person here opposing this case. There is one person virtually opposing this case who wishes to speak on the matter. And the applicant is being uh, brought in right now. So uh, give me a minute, Mr. Chairman, and we'll get the applicant going on their presentation. Okay. Yes. 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 I am. Good morning, everyone. Uh, My name is uh, Vladimir Popov, and I'm here to represent uh, uh, case number Z46, application for rezoning of property with the parcel ID 1800220100, located on George Jerkins Boulevard. Uh, the site plan we are proposing, I, we, if we can move uh, to the site plan the presentation. Okay. <laughs> yeah, folks. Well, we can see a site plan in our books, so you can just talk to it. Yes, uh, we're uh, proposing an open storage and parking concept, um, and uh, we have, as I said, attached the, the site plan for the property. Uh, it will be uh, uh, parking and open storage over gravel with uh, six feet um, chain link fence uh, going all around of the property. Uh, it's just to address uh, uh, some um, recommendations from the um, staff. Uh, we are going to uh, also extend our proposal for uh, uh, 50 feet um, landscape buffer on the north end of the property, which is uh, adjacent to a residential property, uh, undeveloped residential property. Um, Furthermore, uh, we, are, we are willing to adhere for the uh, DOT standards uh, uh, for the entrance uh, uh, to the, to the um, uh, proposed concept, uh, parking and open storage. Uh, the entrance uh, would be over, uh, uh, will be, will be a, a hard top, and will, the gate for it will be uh, 70 feet away as per DOT standards from the, uh, from the curb of the road. We have not included in the uh, current site plan, as pointed by the Department uh, of Stor Stormwater Management, uh, uh, but there will be uh, control controls for stormwater management uh, just to meet the requirements of the uh, department, uh, as they propose one in the um, southwest and one in the northeast corners of the property. Uh, and just to apply for f future development for uh, land disturbance permit, uh, we would need to make the, the proper adjustments for that. Um, furthermore, for the, I saw the comments about the, um, uh, the tree density of the property. Um, we are willing to uh, uh, 
adhere to the uh, standards of the of the department and uh, either plant trees as pointed in the recommendation or uh, donate to the fund for planting trees and we will keep as much as possible trees on the property and here i want to point out that uh, uh, the south uh, border of the property uh, on the uh, southeast and the southwest end of the property there anywhere from 30 to 60 feet unusable of that property which acts as a additional buffer uh, because uh, there is a power line corridor going going through that portion of the property and it separates the property uh, with that buffer furthermore from uh, the residential corner of the uh, southwest on the southwest board okay Anything else you'd like to tell us? Uh, just to point also out that uh, there, in the area, there are um, uh, also other manufacturing and uh, the paper mill company and uh, other industrial um, parcels out there. And it's a mixed residential and industrial. That's why we're applying for a heavy industrial to accommodate, uh, uh, to accommodate the, uh, the concept that we're looking for. And I've seen uh, in the recommendations that uh, uh, from the staff that they're uh, recommending a deletion to a light industrial. And I uh, just want to say that if, if, uh, if it's not permitted for a heavy industrial or light industrial, it would suffice for the, for the proposed concept if, uh, we, if all the variances are approved and we can uh, do the, the, proposed, uh, the, the proposed site plan for uh, open storage and parking uh, over gravel. Because in my understanding, uh, for uh, just to put a gra gravel surface in there would, would require a heavy industrial. If that can be done with the light industrial, we are willing to go that route as well. Okay. Anything else you want to tell us? And from uh, uh, if there is any opposition on the project, we are also willing to work with uh, with any opposing parties and. Uh, Extending uh, the buffer and the, the green uh, uh, landscape uh, buffer zones uh, as needed uh, just to uh, accommodate any any of their, their requests per se for uh, keep, keeping the area quiet and, and appeasing to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, that's everything. We'll hear from the opposition now. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, sir. My name is Hi, my name is Randy Willis. I uh, live in the subdivision that adjoins that, the Stevens subdivision. Been living there about 26 years. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of most all of the people in that subdivision who are opposed to it, due to the fact that in our little subdivision there, we're kind of squeezed out by commercial all around us. That little piece of property there adjoins to the power lines there uh, would open up more noise, particulate matter, um, it just would change the environment of our little subdivision. Now, I walked around and I've gotten a petition from signed by everybody that I came in contact, about 90% of that whole subdivision. I've also spoke with the uh, mayor and council of the city of Austell, which is right in that general area. It's my understanding that they have uh, signed a letter also stating that they were opposed to this change of zoning. Uh, changing that zoning right there would would make all kinds of issue changes within our area there. And, uh, basically, that's all i got to say. I want to try and keep our area like it is, a small subdivision of about 60 houses. And I've got about roughly 80 signed signatures opposing it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have the next speaker, please. What's up? Yeah. I believe that's what he's talking about.
It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the open floor and the opportunity to voice what, what we're voicing. Um, first, uh, there's a couple of impacts. Could you give us your names for the record, please? Roger Moore and Catherine, Catherine Fincher. Catherine. Catherine Fincher. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's a safety concerns that's bringing in more traffic. Um, also, <clears throat> if it if it did if it did go through, um, we're concerned about the, the trucks, uh, the amount of trucks that will be coming in, and if it has to go through, um, we would definitely like to talk to the person, you know, about certain things as far as trucks coming in and leaving. Uh, you talked about a, a chain link fence. Well, in this community, it will be right in front of us, right across the street, and uh, that 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 would that would not work, not at all. To look at that. Okay, so you live in the house directly across the street. Yes, from one okay. of Yes, yes. It would. We would request something, something to block the noise of noise pollution. We got gravel. Gravel is going to. Uh, d diminish the air quality by the amount of trucks going over it, creating the dust. Uh, our property value will go down. Um, I think that's that's uh, kind of it. But we we highly oppose oppose it. Okay. And if there's, way, if there's a way we could document, go further. Where, where we really can be heard, I, I would like to know. We would like to know. Okay, well, there will be a meeting with the Board of Commissioners in two weeks, on September 15th, and then make the final decisions. So you want to speak at that meeting as well. Thank you. Okay, can I say this? Uh, and to me, we would get the worst of it. If it's my understanding where they would be coming in, they would enter that. Because my house, our house is the first house, and to me, we would be getting the worst of it. Yeah, it's right across the street from you. Yes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that all? We'll have the next speaker. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and did we have somebody virtually? Person came in person. We do not have anyone waiting online. Okay. Okay. So I guess with that, we'll close the public comment portion of the hearing. And it's back to this board. This case is in my district, so I'm handling it. Uh, I do want to note uh, that the city of Ostell, uh, Mary, Mayor Ollie Clemens, has sent a letter objecting to this. And the content of the letter really says that the city's vision, and I should back up and say that if we can zoom out a little bit on the GIS, you'll see that this is an island surrounded by the city of Austell. Uh, so it's really, <clears throat> it's, it's really, uh, you know, a little unique in that back when they were allowed to to zone that way and some of that property that's in the islands actually owned by the city of Austell. Some of it's owned by Cobb County and then some of it's individual. Uh, so it's, it's even a little bit less than, than it appears that's, that's kind of not incorporated. The Austell gas systems there kind of to the to the right of the islands. The, the upper portion and they own some of those parcels along there. Uh, so the city of Austell sent a letter objecting to this, basically saying that, you know, the Austell does not want to add heavy industrial zoning to the footprint. Uh, through the Atlanta Regional Committee, the city is in the process of studying current and future land use in an effort to improve the quality of life for citizens in our community, spur investment, and improve property value. 
And it says today Australia is seeing a significant amount of economic development interest in in changing the zoning to heavy industrial with Lund area near residential to several undesirable uses for the city where buildable land is scarce. And uh, you know they they also say in here that they set up a task force in Austell. They have all kinds of these little islands around the city uh, with a parcel or two. I think we see another one over there on the screen down in the lower left hand corner. Uh, and they set up. They've kind of tasked their their staff with seeing what they can do to possibly annex some of those those islands that remain uh, to get it within there. But uh, they do say in here that if this was their peer before, if this was in the city of Austell and was their peer before them, that they would deny it. Uh, and basically that the, their vision uh, this does not reflect the land use and type of business for the new vision of us fellow reflected in our most current comprehensive plan. And I think that's, that's new information that wasn't available to the staff uh, when the staff made their comments. And, and basically, the Ostell comprehensive plan wouldn't support this. And even our comprehensive plan doesn't support this, to be honest. But we're closer to it than theirs by the sounds. And that, that gives me pause with it being an island, and especially hearing from the neighbors directly across the street, and also from the subdivision, because the amount of dust and and traffic and that that's going to create for the people uh, parking on gravel, especially. There's a reason why in light industrial, uh, you know, hardened surfaces are required because we allow light industrial closer to residential. And in this case, it's directly across the street from residential and also a corner of the property is. So I wonder if. If uh, any of the other commissioners have thoughts on on the you know conflict with the Stell vision and that, and, and what do you guys think of this case? Okay, go ahead, Tom. Chair. You know, I, I think I think we have to give great weight to to cities when they when they weigh in on these things. Um, and, and certainly there's a, you know, the neighbor directly across the street would be close. I would think that there would be ways to mitigate uh, dust and things to, to avoid that. In our portion of the district, we certainly deal with lots of areas that are redeveloping. And I think when you look at the, the overall map here, you can see a great deal of conflict between between, you know, obviously heavy industrial uses, uh, just, you know, directly to the southeast, you can see what appears to be a large warehouse or manufacturing facility with lots of tractor trailers parked. We see the manufacturing facilities directions. Um, if, if the use of this property was limited to, to the proposed parking and outdoor storage, I think that it would, you know, it doesn't take a lot of capital to invest in that, and it would not, it would not prevent this from redeveloping as residential or some other use in the future, as these parcels are consolidated and everyone gets a gets a better a better idea of what direction these parcels, you know, could move. So if if we could mitigate the dust and and those types of things and limit the even to use to just the one proposed so that it just said, you know, we don't approve light industrial and, and 60 days from now we have a permit for a large facility to be built. Then I think there could be something there that would, would not eliminate the city's options if they were to annex it at a later date because there's no large capital improvements on the site. Okay, thank you, Tony. And uh, and Fred wants to weigh in. Uh, 
Well, I, I really thought Tony's idea was an excellent one. Uh, I do know that staff was going to require a 50 foot landscape buffer across the northern parcel line. Right. Which I thought was a great idea. That's required by code. But what I need to know is where else are the residential properties that led up to this? Because I think I think that's a great idea, but I think it needs to be expanded some if there's any kind of residential property letting up. Right. And that's the, the people directly across the street now because there's a road in in between it's not a code requirement to have that buffer than the other residential here is at that little corner down there where they just touch at the corner, the subdivision uh, where the gentleman spoke from. I thought it would require at least a 30 foot landscape buffer along the main road on the right because of the residential subdivision across the street. Yeah. And what's your thoughts, Judy? For me, one of the concerns I have is the fact that it's just talking of vehicles without without anything. And how long does he want to do that? Maybe he said it and missed it. I didn't. I didn't hear any limit on time. And if we approve the zoning, it's approved. Right. And and I just wondered if. Perhaps since he's just wanting to park, if we go with a land use permit, that might not be enough. But I'm wondering if we could do a land use permit at this time because we're not exactly sure what the city of Austell wants to do. Um, and part of it is it's all wooded now, so it's going to take substantial work to get it usable. So I, I wouldn't think anybody would want to do all that just on a land use permit. Well, I don't know. It it doesn't take a whole lot to do what he's wanting to do. Not really. Right. It doesn't sound like he's paving anything. Yeah, uh, and I kind of I had I personally have an issue with the gravel parking because that creates a lot of dust in that. It, it creates a mess. So I, I'm just wondering so, if this is really. I know staff recommended deleting it to light and dust. Right. And, um. Well, I guess I would go if I was going to go. I would go with the light industrial for this use only, and that they would have to come up with a watering plan as to how they would uh, address the uh, dust that would be coming from the site. Okay. Uh, let's. Okay. Those are all thoughts. You know, I, Alice, do you have anything you want to weigh in on? I had been thinking about the land use permit as well as a possibility. Okay. Okay, and that would be something. That is, I, I guess maybe what we should do, because I'm more inclined to lean towards not approving it because there's changing factors, but I think we maybe can get I'm thinking of holding it and having the applicant try and work with the people who spoke and with the city of Austell and see if maybe they can come to, you know, some type of um, agreement that everybody would be happy with. That's and possibly a land use permit and, and ask staff to explain to the applicant what that would mean. And uh, that, so I think I'm going to make a motion to hold this and tell our October hearing and ask the applicant to work with the opposition to see if they can come to common ground. Second. Look at it again then. Second. Okay, I think I heard a second from Alice. Judy. And, uh, I think it's Judy, but. Okay, okay, sorry. That's okay. Judy. So second from Judy. And any further comment? Okay, with that, we will, uh, we'll all those in favor, please raise your hand, and I can't, I just, okay, now I'll see Tony, and I can't see you, Alice, so if you could tell me. Approved. Okay, four to zero. And John, if you could let the neighbor that I told would be a hearing in two weeks with the Board of Commissioners know that there won't be one with the Board of Commissioners in two weeks, and we'll be back there in a month. Okay, appreciate it. It's positive. And on that, so I think with that, 
uh, motion carried five to zero to hold it until October. And with that, I believe we completed the, the zoning case agenda, but we have some other business to, to attend to. I think we can get through that pretty quick. All the Okay, whatever you're ready, Brian. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm with the County Attorney's Office. I'm here to present changes to uh, Chapter 134 regarding uh, changing the name of adult entertainment to sexually oriented businesses. Uh, the, the, the corpus and the substance of these changes are found in other chapters outside the purview of this commission. But this commission is uh, requested to make a recommendation for changes under its purview in Chapter 134 for zoning. You have seen copies of uh, the proposed changes uh, for consideration today, and we would request a recommendation uh, for these changes and a motion in a second. Thank you. All right, okay, thank you. I believe we have to open a public uh, comment period. Do we have anybody who wants to comment? I do not believe anyone is here to, to comment. Okay. Uh, so now, if you just want to put on the record the reason why, I think change it. Probably not. <laughs> so, okay. With, with that, is there any discussion you can ask that? Brian, Brian, would you like to just explain to, for folks what what uh, what the reason was for making the change? What what prompted this? Well, I can't speak as to the prompting all this, but it is wholesale changes to the adult entertainment code, changing it to sexually oriented businesses, changing some of the parameters by which. These businesses are authorized and regulated within the unincorporated county, Cobb County. Um, but again, just under this purview, it just relates to Chapter 134, which is primarily references to the term sexually oriented businesses. Forgive me for not being more more knowledgeable about this, but is this is this a, a change which is being recommended generally by various cities, counties, uh, certain 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 entities? Uh, or is this just something that, that we decided to do here at Cobb? Well, Cobb County is requesting to make these changes uh, for its sexually oriented businesses in, in the county, incorporated county. Um, there are some uh, businesses operating in unincorporated county. This will be this recommendation and other uh, changes to other chapters will be presented to the Board of Commissioners for uh, approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other yeah, questions or comments? Tony, go ahead. Yes, uh, Brian, one question just to clarify. Uh, you had uh, submitted a draft out to us, and I use that word and because there was one situation where there was an and in a series of, uh, of items, and we indicated that that should be an an. Yes, that was an and. <laughs> That's been amended. Correct. That that will be addressed in the yeah. final draft presented to the board of commissioners. But this body can suggest to make that uh, edit grammatical edit as well in its recommendation. Be good. Uh, okay. Any further comments? I don't see any. So, does somebody want to make a motion? Uh, Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve um, Section 134 and the uh, items uh, listed as recommended by the uh, County Attorney's Office. Okay. Do we have a second? Okay. okay. That was that was you, Judy. That was Alex. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I hear a voice, but I don't see a, a sound. Uh, okay. So we have a. Second, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion? 
And Alice, if you could tell me yours. Approve. Okay, so so that carries five to zero for approval. Okay. And on next, I think we have some minutes to to approve. Do you want to make a motion for minutes, Judy? Yeah, I want to make a motion to approve the special call meeting for August 24th and for August the 12th. Okay. That's okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, second from Alice. Any further discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor? And Alice, if you can tell me yours and That's give your hand up, Tony. Okay, now I can see it. You're just a little off screen. I see it now. So, okay, so I guess we carry those five to zero. Yeah. Does anybody else have any further business? I don't think so. With that, then we're adjourned. Okay. That was good.